All right, guys, we've got a new limited edition drop, the original Mountain Dog Tee that John Meadows had us design from the very beginning. So it's the first tee that he had made. Once again, this is a limited edition item. So when they're gone, they're gone. While I have your attention, you've seen me wear this one in a few podcasts to date. We've been holding back on it. This here, the four star T, I think that's what we call it. It's on the website, new items, also under limited edition. Check out our shoulder saver pads. It's an easy way to do limited restricted range of motion exercises like board press that basically you just pop the pad on the bar, reduces the range of motion, pop it back off when you're done. Thank you guys for the support. Head over to EliteFTS.com. Time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. All right, guys, we're back with another episode of Table Talk. Today, my guest is Dane Miller, the owner of Garage Strength. He's known as one of the best strength coaches in weightlifting, track and field, and just programming in general. We're going to talk a lot about programming in general today, and actually not in general, in <laughs> specific, so we'll go a little bit deeper. Um, you've coached athletes from peewees all the way up to state national and olympians you've worked with people to get to state championships all american ncaa the olympics and how many different professional franchises two two different professional yeah, franchises two. and as a husband father coach author entrepreneur yeah trying to be and we can just keep going right. with all the other things that you're working on so we'll get into all that um, where I want to start is kind of where all most podcasts do. I want to go back to how you started training in the first place, but I'm going to kind of fast forward through it a little bit because okay. you grew up on a farm, I believe. I, I grew up in farm, a farm area and I worked on a farm in high school. Yeah. Okay. And then in high school, before you got into high school, what were you doing there? Cause I know what you were doing in high school, but when did you start sp- participating in sport so i uh, ever since we were younger we were swimming or wrestling or uh playing soccer i got into football in middle school uh but predominantly wrestling uh swimming baseball like the standard mm-hmm. uh standard stuff but my dad was a wrestling coach and my mom was a swim coach so we sort of had to do those two things uh when we were when we were in our youth basically when when did you begin to focus down on football and track and field um, probably around, I want to say in like sixth, seventh grade, uh, my dad, we would go lift quite a bit. Um, and at his high school where he, where he was an athletic director and during, during middle school, it was like, okay, I, I'm pretty good at all these sports, but it was mainly wrestling. Um, and at the time baseball and then football. And then by the time I got into high school, I started to gain quite a bit. I, by my 10th grade year, I was like, 230 and that's when i really started to focus more so on wrestling uh throwing and then football and that's like really where i started to just get obsessed with with training did that put you in the super heavyweights for wrestling yeah yeah i was so i was a heavyweight and i was behind a dude who uh medaled at states twice in like our area if you medal at states or if you're a state champ like you get a parade yeah. thrown for yeah. you like you're a god basically so my whole life at that up to that point, it was like, I was going to be a state champ wrestler. That was all I was focused on in my junior year. Uh, I was start, I was going to start and I actually broke my left arm, which I was out for the year. And then that's when I started to shift more into track and field. And that's, that's when that started to take off for me. When, when that shift happened outside of the arm, what was the catalyst for that? I think mainly there's a, a couple different things. It's like the success I had right away. It was like, I, I couldn't, I had my left arm like immobilized here and I couldn't move so I could squat um, with a safety bar squat, like an old school safety bar squat. And I could do leg presses. I could do lunges and things like that. And I had never, 
I never paid big attention to training my legs at that point. Um, and I started, you know, basically just working entirely on my leg strength, hip strength. And when I, my junior year then in track, I just like blew up and I got uh, fourth at States as a junior. And I started to realize like, wait, there's something to the training that I'm doing. And then I had a really, really big year uh, of football. Um, and that started to sort of take off, but it was mainly based around that success I had in track and field my junior year sort of created this validity for the work I had put in even when I was injured. And it, and it, it created that like carrot, like, okay, mm -hmm. now you, you can continue to blossom in football, in track and field and become a, like a power sport athlete. And that's really, it really stemmed from that immediate response I got from track as a, as a junior. What was the dynamic with just the work ethic from wrestling to track for yeah. you back then? Yeah. Wrestling's that, a different it, breed. It's a totally different breed. And, and I, you know, growing up, my dad coached a lot of like really good one of his guys actually fought in the ufc um and being around his group of wrestlers and also just my dad's work ethic uh and going into the weight room on a regular basis it was like in a technical sport like wrestling and something that is so hard um and dude honestly swimming sort of like that like you can't you can't not work hard and be good yeah so if you want to be good at swimming or wrestling um, that just instills that work ethic. And I think too, my parents were very much like, they weren't pushy, but it was just like, are, are you going to go outside and lift or, or what? And I think that that's like the big aspect is like the wrestling and, and the support from my parents of like, you know, it's, you gotta, you gotta actually do this stuff. You've got to train like five, six days a week, and you've got to make sure that you're doing the, the technical stuff around the sports. And that's, I, I think that's really what what enabled me to be able to go from being solely focused on wrestling to pivot to track and, and more so football, uh, but, or more so track, but also football. I think it's still just that, that work ethic was a, the security blanket really. Now through high school, you were an all American football, right? I was all state. All state yep. football. Yep. So when it came to going to Penn state, <clears throat> were you thinking football or just track? So I had this mindset. Um, I wanted to do. I wanted to go play football in college, but it was the best school that recruited me. The two best schools, and one you'll relate to. Uh, I went on a recruiting visit to Temple, and they played Virginia Tech. And this is when the Vet still existed, the old stadium. And Kevin Jones, who was a, a first round draft pick later, put up 277 yards on Temple, and they lost like 65 to seven and i was there for temple like as a recruit i was like well i don't know if i want to go to temple and get my ass beat every yeah. every week uh and then the other one the other school was uh kent state was recruiting me for track and for football and at the time kent was also terrible at football so it was like all right why well, i i don't know like and a whole bunch of one double a schools were recruiting me but then penn state and and virginia tech and Syracuse, like a bunch of power five schools for track were recruiting me. I'm like, all right, well, why don't I just go all in on, on track? And then that's where I, I sort of made that decision to, to just focus entirely on track at that point. So when you went there, you, I don't believe you were scholarship until the second year. Yes. Yeah. Sophomore so year. How, so was it a walk on? I don't know how track works. So track, it's like you get 12 and a half scholarships for 40 people, basically. Um, and unless you're a dog, like you're not really getting much money up front. And then you have to go and perform and you you go, you know, I, I'm i there, I'm on, I'm active. I go to Big Tens as a freshman. I get ninth place uh, at Big Tens, which is pretty good as a freshman, especially in like a power-based sport. Outdoors, I ended up getting seventh as a freshman. And that's, and then I started to comp compete very well at like the regional and, and national level. Um, or was starting to like peck at the national level at that point. So I'm like 19. Um, and then that's when I started to roll into, that's when I started to get money uh, for track. And I, my sophomore year was probably my best year, but that's really where like probably my earliest success at, at like that national level for track was. Was there any point during that time when you were in college that you were looking at the training as more than just the training for the sport? Not as you do now, right? Because it's yeah, a big yeah, difference yeah. now. Yeah. But was it just the part of the sport that you had to do? Not saying that you didn't like it, but there's a difference between liking it and loving it. Right. So 
I think it's if we would rewind, my dad would let us like look through like um flex or like iron mag because like back in the day back in the mid to late 90s if we went to the grocery store you could see those they'd have like the magazine shelves and we could we could look through those so i i always had this interest and then after my so my senior year there's this guy named paul ferency and he's like this big time highland games guy in from our area from Easton, pa he's since passed away um but he gave me a cassette tape so this is my senior year a vhs cassette he hands it he's like you gotta watch this and it was like all these throwing highlights and then at the end it was werner gunther's training video and it was all in french and so he had given me his phone number and he's like if you have any questions hit me up and he had worked with a guy named harrison bailey who's a world champion in, in the highland game so this is my senior year of high school and we found a French teacher to translate Werner Gunther, who is this freak shot putter. And people have seen probably his, his like bounds up the steps yeah. and stuff. Right. So at that point, I started to think about training for football or training for, uh, even, and I would have other athletes like wrestlers hit me up as they knew I was going for track, but they would be like, well, what are you going to do with training? And, and that, that's probably the earliest point that I remembered thinking about it outside of of what you know training for the sport and then as i went through school my 2005 was my sophomore slash junior year of college and that's when youtube came out and i remember uh ross enamite who ran at the time like ross um he was posting videos and you guys were posting on t nation uh, and I even think Woodski had like gashead.org at the time too. Like, so I was just by my, my freshman, sophomore year, I was very into the training that I was doing, but also the training that I would think about doing if I was playing, if I was a wrestler yeah. or, or another sport, really. Did you see correspondence between your training and the throwing while you were in college? I don't know if I had made that connection yet. I think it was like... I saw correspondence to a point. Yeah. But I think one of my biggest downfalls was like by my junior year, I, I remember being uh, like stupid strong. I back squatted high, uh, low bar 600, uh, not by your standards, mm-hmm. but for us 600 for six. And I could bench like 475 for a double. Um, and that was like my worst year throwing because I got super heavy and I just couldn't move. And I think that, that was when I realized there's a fine line between being like stupid strong, but also being like super poppy, Mm -hmm. especially in a sport like, like track and field. And you've got to like balance them and, and, and play the seesaw game until you can get, get the right formula for yourself or whatever. And I think that that's when that frustration that I had is when I started to question a lot of from the coach I was working with. And then I also started to look into you know, at the time, uh, Dr. Anatoly Bunderchuk, what he had done with his throwers. And I started to think about other other throwing training systems and then what I would do if I was coaching myself or what I would want from a system to try and elicit a better response, maybe. Did you have the ability to pivot your training then? No, no. Because at college, it's like, yeah, you, mm. you're just like at the whim of the college coach. And it's like, you tell somebody that your college coach might not I always thought like maybe we didn't throw enough. It's a technical sport. Maybe we should have been doing more throwing. And it's crazy because looking back now, like that's where the throwing world has gone that way. Um, but you know, when you come up, it's like, oh, he's a coach at he's a coach at Ohio State or he's a coach at Penn State or he's a coach at wherever. So everybody puts them mm-hmm. on these pedestals, but they're just like us. Yeah. What did you weigh at the time? It's like two ninety. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I was, and I like, I, I think for me, that was probably 25 pounds too heavy, maybe 20 pounds too heavy for me, or at least relative to what we were doing in training. Mm-hmm. I think that was like one of the downfalls is like, what part did you think that you lost? Just the explosiveness? Yeah, the pop. Yeah. Like just having just straight up like twitchy pop. I didn't, I, I I've all like, I, I completely lost any, like, I'm going to fuck you up. Like. Yeah. You know. See, that's a tough one to explain to people. Yeah. What that means. I just felt like if if we would like 
I know what you mean, but it's just I'm trying to help the audience okay, understand. Okay, so like a dynamic, like, boom! Yeah, like, like, like that right piece. from the start. Yeah, super snappy. Like, and I think about almost, maybe it's like a rubber band where, you know, when I would be at my most explosive, um, I, I, I think it's like, you almost feel like I could, I could like rip the fucking door handle off or like rip a, a steering wheel out of a car. Uh, really explosive, you know. I, I, yeah, it's it's funny because it's like when I'm trying to describe it now, it's like that dynamic, super super snappy feeling. And I got what I think happened is I got really really strong, but we weren't we weren't like feeding the strength movements here with with the big uh, explosive stuff that I needed to be doing, or at least I, that I thought I should have been doing. Really, the way that I've always felt that is, if it, say if I'm doing a box squat, that initial flex off the box right off. Could, you, the bar like thuds mm -hmm. you know and if that would go away it'd be like I'm fucked. Fuck, yeah i'm fucked for yeah. me it's like especially i was fucked because i was more explosive than strong and if then that flipped i'm fucked yeah because i can't generate the force yep to get it to move um bench is a little different do you feel that in deadlift too no no because on that one as the bars changed over the years <clears throat> you have to pull slow and then fast it's it's almost kind of in a fucked up way become like an Olympic lift. Okay. Where there's two pulls. Yeah. There's the original pull to pull the, the slack, slack yeah. right? Then there's the second pull. So if you rush the first one, you're done on your the hips second. are going to get fucked. Yeah. You know, but if you slow, then go. Right. Now straight bar, yeah, I did feel that, you know, because it you didn't could do almost, that. I almost would relate to it with the second pull on the dead, on the dead now then would yes. be like that. Okay, set, 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 boom. Like, yes. Maybe for for your audience, I think that would be uh, that, that losing that, you're toast. You're fucked. Yeah. Especially if you're an explosive athlete to begin with. Right. You're just fucked. Yeah. And think about it. It's like you're throwing a shot that's 16 pounds. Like, it's not, it's heavy, mm -hmm. but it's not that heavy, yes. you know, relative. And I, so I think the, the lighter the implement or the lighter the opposition, the op opposing load is, the snappier you'll have to be. So you, <clears throat> During that time, you were reading Bondershock, right? So you just like went deep in the weeds, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, Can, Canthrows.com also had all of Werner Gunther's training on their website, too. So it was reading, reading that as well. Did he work with Bondershock? No, so that was all he took all. Uh, no, Gunther did not work with Bondershock, no. Okay. But it was just. A freak, though. Yeah, yeah, absolute <laughs> freak. Yeah. You know, those videos, I'm surprised we haven't seen them reemerge. Yeah, Finally, yeah, yeah. You need to do a video for your channel. <laughs> Man, so there's some content ideas. Because it's about time. Because yeah. usually it's every few years. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Like, what the fuck? Yeah, where's the cycle? Yeah, yeah, it's like the cycle's not come back yet. <laughs> and everything filters through. Um, so what, what was the catalyst to get you to go to Canada to work with him? I, I think for me... I think too, and, and I, I want to just also point out in case my college coach is listening to this, is that like, I need to be clear too, for me, it wasn't just a training system either. It was the environment. It it was like, I, I, I tend to have a little bit of like an all in personality. So when I started to drink and I started to party, it was like, I like partying and drinking. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think that took some of my pop, my recovery away, clearly. Um, I think that played a big role. So for me, it was like, not to get too off task from your question, but I think it was like, I need to deal with my drinking and try to change my environment as much as I can. Um, and I need to have some type of change. And, and at the time then it was like, there's this old forum. Um, dude, I used to have this routine it would be like okay check t nation okay check your website okay check um uh where was paul Quinn mainly writing i think at the time it was still t nation and then i would go on the ring it was called so the ring would have all of these throwers it was just throwers and you would talk about throwing and randomly one day somebody posted and they said dylan armstrong who's a canadian shot putter it was looking for training partners for the 2008 olympics and so this was 07 um and i was like dude if i i had actually applied i was a religious studies in history major and i had decided that i was either going to go two routes i was either going to try to become a professor in religious studies and history or i was going to go and become and learn from dr b which was essentially i i believed would be like my master's degree essentially and uh i i got into school at temple and i talked to some of their um 
some of their professors and they're like, well, the, the downfall is you don't know Hebrew and you don't know Greek. And I, and I was sort of like, okay, well maybe I, I shouldn't do this. Um, and I like lifting more anyway. So that's when it was like, okay, I'm going to go train with Dr. B with Dylan. And I had contacted them about how I can move to Canada, how I can set up camp there, uh, how I can work and how I can learn and train from with Dr. B and, and then see what I could do. And I did have in the back of my mind long term that this would be like, I could either get a job or create a company or a business that I would then implement these principles based off of what I did in college too, and, and try to mold something together. So when, when you went there was how much of the aspiration was that compared to seeing if you can make it to the trials? It was more of or like worlds at the time. right? Yeah. Because yeah. It's, well, it's, where did that fall in the Olympic cycle? It would have been right into the Olympic cycle. Okay. Yeah. I, for me, I thought it would be a long shot to make the trials. Um, my training partner made the U S trials. Dylan ended up getting third at the Olympics that year. Um, I was such a fringe person and I knew it would take a little bit longer than a year. Dr. B had told me he thought three years that I could do, I could get on the international level. Uh, so I knew right away when he had said that. And I did end up almost, you know, I had a very good year with him, almost PRing, uh, like within like the first like six months. And I knew, I knew for me, it was like, it was more about learning from Dr. B and proving to myself as an athlete that I wasn't a total wash, which I felt like I got from being there. And then at the time, How, what do you mean by that? Like a wash in the sense that I had this huge growth period in my, my freshman sophomore years as a collegiate athlete, I made it to NCAAs. I was, I was on the path to being an NCAA all American. And that was the only goal I had. I wanted to be an all American. And then like, I didn't achieve any of that. I wasn't an All-American. And I think that, that was, that's really what still ironically motivates me to a point today. Um, not entirely, but a little bit. But it's like I wanted to prove out that I wasn't a total scrub, like that I, that I, I had left something in college that I, that I didn't perform to the level that I believe I could have possibly have performed. And going and learning from Dr. B, learning his principles, and then also still performing very well, I then used that when I moved back home, back to Pennsylvania, and I, you know, I, I, my wife now at the time, my girlfriend, we got pregnant or she got pregnant and I ended up PRing while she's pregnant, while I'm owning a gym after I moved back uh, from training with Dr. B, sort of like putting all that together just to sort of like prove it to myself yeah in some sick like that rocky you got shit in the basement exactly. stuff exactly <laughs> yeah i feel like all strength that not all yeah. of them, but a lot of strength athletes have that like fat kid self-conscious feeling that you're just trying to prove everybody that you have some self-worth you know or, when when you got there what were some of the things that were radically different the biggest thing <laughs> i still remember going into uh to see dr b and being like i i want to be blown blown away and like i, I want to i want to compare this when i walked in here to your place i was like holy fuck like literally blown away but blown away and just like the magnitude of what you've got going on here the the they, i loved it i was like this is it's it's a feeling that I, I i immediately channeled closely to to the feeling when i moved to kamloops canada with dr b it was I started to warm up and then like you do a general warm up and then a dynamic warm up and then you get into your throws warm up. And I was doing that as like a, a trained American athlete. And he's like looking at me and he's like, what you do? And he, he can't speak great English. What you do? Why you do? And he's like screaming at me to get in the circle, like right away before I would even do anything. And that was like, I had no idea what he was saying. So Dylan's like, he's telling you get in a fucking circle and just start throwing. Like we don't do that shit. So there was no warm up that was like very general. Um, but the biggest thing was like, we didn't lift that heavy and it was the same workout in the morning. Then you do the same in the afternoon. Then you do the same the next morning and you do the same thing at that, that night. And it was, you could do this for six weeks, literally the exact same lift. You do one lift 12 times in a week. And that was, and then sometimes he would change it where you'd have a lift one and a lift two, lift one and a lift two. And then, and then that. As we got closer to the season, we would throw, lift, throw, lift, throw, lift in the same session. And that was just shit that I was never open. Like, I I never had experienced any of that. And he actually, yeah, like, that was just, it was so specific to the sport of throwing. And 
I think I would say like if on the realm, on the spectrum, if you see like really, really, really strong absolute strength here and then specificity over here on, on like the spectrum of specificity, Dr. You know, being strong's here, Dr. B was way over here. And then sort of in the middle now is sort of where we exist, I think. But it's, it, was, it was just so wildly different from anything I had ever done. Was there any phasic structure to what he was doing that you could pick up? No. Other, did you, than, did other you, than measuring our throws. Were his books out at that time? His one book was out. I read the entire book twice before we went there, transfer training, and I had no idea what it, I read yeah. it twice. And I was like, this is the worst trans, like I didn't, I, I remember talking to Derek Evely in when I first moved there and he was like, I, I don't think they did a good job like explaining it. I was like, I don't even know. It's like a cryptic. It's rough. Yeah. It's so boring. And like, it's like one of those things where you'd read like a page and a half and you're starting to think about other stuff. So mm -hmm. like some of his newer ones, he's like a throws book that actually came out that is a little bit better, but they're still just very broken and, and confusing to a point and maybe that's a system you know i don't know i think at the time when those came out from what i observed it, it got people thinking more along the long the lines of what is dynamic correspondence yeah and then redefining kind of what that means yeah you know from not just exercises but you know motor unit recruitment or so it it, I don't know if it was even in his book. That's because I've read them. Yeah. Right. And, and but so I'd read them, and you'd be like, "What the fuck is this?" You read it again, like, "What the fuck is this?" Yeah. yeah. Right? And then you would see these conversations going on over there that kind of stemmed from that because they would quote that. Yeah. Then I would ask those people, like, "What the hell did you read that made you think that?" And yeah. I just think they just saw the word correspondence, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. And then just started to look at it and then that differently. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of trying to simulate the same thing yeah you know with heavier implements which is what he did exactly I, I was gonna say is that 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 was the other thing throwing heavy implements and light implements i think the biggest impact that i see today um is the technical model of his his shot technique uh and if if you would look back if you're if you know track and field or anything the old style of spinning would be like you would jump up out of the back and you land in the middle and you jump on the finish. And Dr. B's style was around down, around forward. You finish forward, you don't jump, you finish out. And I think that that also gets created by throwing heavier implements, by throwing so frequently, you learn that like you need to be grounded to apply force into the ball. Like if you're off the ground, you're not accelerating anymore. And I think that's that correspondence that you're talking about. I think that that's the biggest thing that you see today. If you look at Ryan Krauser's technique versus John Godina's technique, it's they're totally different movement patterns. And clearly the one is better than the other, like by far and away. Not yeah. that John Godina was bad, but that it's been an improvement in the sport because of I don't know if that has anything to do with Dr. B, but I think that I think there's something to it. When when you got there, I think I heard on Zach's podcast you were throwing sixty pound dumbbells. Yeah, yeah, uh, fifty, yeah, fifty pound dumbbells. We do like shuffles and throw. All right, so you went from just throwing your college shot, which yep. is what sixteen, yep, to sixty pounds. Yep. And how often were you throwing that when you got there? We would go some. So that might be like a, a two. Like let's say you have a workout in the morning and a workout in the afternoon. That second workout, we do four sets of fifteen. Shuffle. So the second was the heavier. Yeah, heavier. And then one. the morning was the lighter. You, yeah, you might do like. 4k throws for height something like that and that's where it's like dude that i remember the first month being sore like i like you have muscle soreness you have fatigue and stuff but i was like sore to the bone like my ribs were sore my my elbows my wrists like and like you couldn't stop eating like you're just you're throwing so much and and heavy and light and and different implements that it was like I mean there was points where we were throwing concrete block out in the snow like you're just throwing literally anything that you can toss, um, and it and it just like the my body it was like my body couldn't figure out what the fuck was going on for the first six weeks eight weeks probably I mean it probably was longer than that but that that was noticeable. So while you were there, I'm assuming that you're having conversations with him and you're picking his brain the whole time. Yeah. What were some of the main things, takeaways that you had for your time there? I think the coolest part with Dr. B was he was so openly, he was so open, like not a lot of people would ask him questions. 
But he would let me come over to his house and he would take naps in the middle of the day between the sessions. And I would go over, he'd be laying down in his couch in the basement. And this would go on for like six to eight weeks. Then he would yell at me to leave him alone. And I would take like a, like the notebook here and I'd just write, write all these questions, right? And I'd ask him everything under the sun. Uh, and he would even tell me stories like his first memory was a tank driving over when Stalin imposed a famine on Ukraine and stuff like crazy shit that you would just pull out of him. Um, all in broken English, obviously, but I think the biggest thing was like his willingness to be open and share what he, what he would talk about. And then he would also say it, it wasn't necessarily about his training system. It wasn't that this is the right way. It was like, look, this is a training system and you need to have these like principles of a system. And that means you have to have a technical model for the throw, whatever throw that you're coaching. And there has to be some strength component. There has to be the dynamic and then the specific component of it. And you've got to understand what that is in your system. But that system could exist different, different ways. And so I would often just ask him, like almost looking for what's the, the, the silver bullet. But, it, but he'd be like, you can do this. You can make your own system and you can create it and you have to test it. And the biggest thing after that was like, learn from your athletes. So he would have us measure and, and mark how we were feeling and stuff. And then he would change things based off of that. And I think that for me, my takeaway from him is that you can have a different system and still be successful, but ultimately you've got to have something that you can build upon and then learn. And you've got to learn. Yeah. You know, it's great to read books. It's great to learn from other people, but it's also really important to learn from your specific athletes. So what were the indicators he was looking for? I, I think for me, it was always distance, distance thrown. Um, and then that would help him with fatigue. And sometimes you would be so bad for like six or seven straight days and he wouldn't care. Like he would want you to be that bad. Um, distance thrown, how you were moving in the circle too, like technique in the circle. And I, I also think that he had like a, um, I think everybody sort of gets it when you're around the sports, sports for so long that you start to see their fatigue or no, now they're starting to come back up. And so we would measure and as you would come back up and he, we would plot it um, in our, our own journals and, and sort of show him the graphs too. You could start to see your distance start to come back up. And then there might be like 10 days where you'd be just fucking ripping bombs. And so in my, my personal interpretation of what he's, he was doing, he was trying to identify when that period would be and how you could set that up for a, a big so using Dylan as an example, he went to the to Beijing and it was like, okay, how can we get Dylan to be hitting that 10 day time frame based off of all the past data that we've used from the last year and a half, two years to get a 10 day time frame to happen during those three days when when he would be competing, you know, qualification yeah. and then the final. So kind of like a time to peak. Yeah. Yeah. So if it went and once you were really able to figure that out, then did you project after that? Because you can't continue to keep doing that, right? No, so then he would reach. Right. So he would say, he would actually track and say, okay, day 22 to day 27, that's when you're going to be on based off of where we're at in this longer scheme. And it would come down to the specific dates. And he would say, like, these days are when you're going you're, you're gonna to hit this. Um, and then after that, there might be a collapse down. But then he would sort of categorize the athletes as like a type one, a type two, a type three. And I try to expand on this in, in my, my books based off of what I learned from him and off also what I'm learning from my athletes is like, okay, if a type one is like a steady incline here, a type two is a guy that's like sort of up and down all the time. They're going to tell you about their life problems all the time. And they're sort of a pain in the ass to talk to, but sometimes they're a freak. And then a type three would be like a super aggressive person who's going to plummet and then come back up over a long period of time. Um, so he would use those sort of general charts to lay out how you would be peaking over, you know, two months, three months, four months. And then what would then end up happening after you would hit that, that big peak. So that kind of leads into your training philosophy now, which would it be safe to say, where is it? The parabolic periodization would be your underlying training philosophy. Yeah, that and then the garage strength program design. The garage strength program design would be more of like the that would be more of what you would see for like sports performance. And then the periodization model that you get out of the parabolic periodization 
is very specific to weightlifting, but very, very similar to how we overlay sports performance on top of that. So it all kind of lays out the same, the mm -hmm. underlying philosophy, yeah. which is four different blocks. Yeah, four different to, I think there's four key blocks. I like using undulation and the first two blocks, the exposure phase, comprehension phase would be more, those, those are just our branded terms for those two phases of like higher volume. Um, and then we would come down with volume to go to higher intensity, pretty simple on the, the last two ascension phase and the summit phase. Realization phase is a fifth phase that we use if somebody responds really, really well to low volume, like super, super low volume, like a, a classic taper. And I think where I sort of use that as like a swing phase is like some athletes hate, they don't, they don't like tapers and they don't respond well to tapers. And actually like that type one individual I sort of mentioned, I've experienced with my own athletes, weightlifting, throwing, uh, football, where we've had athletes that we've tapered and then not, they're like flat. They have no, no pop at all. Uh, so, but then we do have some athletes that, that respond very well to, to a traditional style taper. So I think that having that fifth phase is like the swing phase to be like, okay, if this person responds really well to when we completely diminish volume and load, this person responds terribly. So let's keep a little bit more intensity on them through their peak. So if we break down these three classifications of athletes, there's what you have different names for them. So we, yeah, we call like, like type one would be like a, a, a Zen, um, type two. So a Zen athlete is somebody who's just going to come in and just do work. And they like, they don't really bitch much. They listen to what you'd say as a coach. And they just they just go, and they pretty much do all their recovery. They don't party. They do everything that you you lay out a system. They're executing it, and they're even keeled. I think. I mean, the the person that pops in my head right now is like Jalen Hurts. Sort of has that that type one. Even when he's intense, I mean, Eagles look like trash the last eight weeks of the year, and he still never like showed total frustration. I think he's like a pop figure that you mm -hmm. can sort of relate to as like a chill guy that's just going to roll with the punches and just keep going. Uh, type two would be like the social individual. I used to call them fragile individuals, but I think people got offended by me saying that they're athletes on site. If I would call them like a type two, they would know that I would think so like type two to me is like somebody who somebody cuts you off and you're driving to work and like you get pissed and it. You basically let it ruin your day. Mm -hmm. So you never know how that person's handling stress. Some weeks stress management is optimal. Some weeks stress management is terrible. And they're going to follow this like up and down. You might not, you might put them in one phase where they're where super high volume in training and they crush it. And then you, and then you decrease, or, or let's say like the next time you come back around and they're in a high volume phase, they're not crushing it. And it's like, because of the, the way that they manage their own, uh, their own personal stress management. I think there's a, the psychological aspect plays into their physiological adaptation and then the third one you know we term like an exuberant individual and and i think in the weightlifting world you can see it as like uh the guys who like hit a big snatch and they're slamming a, a bar and like getting amped up or like uh you know shot putters just screaming losing their mind power lifters same thing like super super meathead ish um individuals but those individuals at times drive themselves into this dark depth uh of of a lack of recovery because they're always wanting to hit big lifts they're always wanting to push in every single exercise that they're doing they can't see the system they can only see how much weight is on the bar and so it's sort of like breaking it up that's how i sort of break the those three up so what happens in your gym when they're all integrated together <laughs> type two cries a lot uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's like i think it's funny because you'll see uh, we have this kid right now um the younger kid is just a total freak of nature and he's just super le level and like if he's training alongside even like high school high school football kids usually tend to be to be normally that type three i would say 75 percent of them right they're like the guys that just want to smash weights and then you have that type one there and it's like the type one sort of just looks at them when they're screaming or hitting big PRs and they, they don't, they think it's almost like a joke. The type one is just always level headed. And I think they do feed off of each other pretty well. Um, and I think that, I think that 
the three and the two are the ones that end up being like they they don't mix as well because they they don't handle their stress as well you know i think myself as a type three where it's like i have anger management problems i have you know i'll cry for a fucking hallmark commercial like uh, that's that's like a type three type person like type two is sort of similar to that but they can't handle like if they trip on the fucking sidewalk, they're going to cry. You know, they're that type of individual. And I think that they, they end up being the ones that can have a negative impact on the whole group at times. So once you know where they are, so say if they're a type two, then how does the training change to accommodate that? Because it sounds like the psychological factors are being implemented into your, your philosophy. So in a, okay, so, so take a sport like weightlifting or throwing or, or, or football, right? If I have a type two, I know that within every two to three days, they have to have a good day of training. Otherwise, the whole cycle's lost. If they have four or five, six days of training that are just like, uh, they're, they're like not doing well, they don't feel good, they've got no connection to the bar, they're trash. So the whole goal, especially, you know, even looking at a thrower, I need to make sure that the thrower, so throwing specific, if they're, they're looking at where their, their implements are landing, we need to make sure that their volume is a little bit lighter on certain days so that the following day, they, every two to three days in throws, they have one big day where they can hit them, where they have a decent result out in the sector and they can see it because they'll, they're going to have that positive response. If they are constantly down, uh, so I'll pick like specific variations that that individual responds really well to like, or an easier variation that they can just smash even when they're tired. The type three and the type one usually can comprehend that the variation or the exercise that I'm gonna give you might be really hard. So an example for weightlifting would be like a low hang snatch is a hard, challenging exercise. A type one type, a type one kid, athlete, they understand that it's gonna improve their posterior chain, their technique, their movement patterns, all the connection to the bar. They understand it might take two to three weeks to get into the groove, but they get that. The type two can't handle low hang snatch because it'll make them down on everything. Uh, for for a thrower, it might be like we only back squat heavy once every two weeks instead of every single week, something like that maybe. So because that back squat on a regular basis can in theory have a negative impact on their their throws. So it's like with that type two individual, it's more so about uh, managing that alteration so that they have a more consistent, better feeling than the type one or the type three. Right. So you're not unlike other coaches. Other coaches are going to just try to stick everybody in a box right, right. that is compromised, right? And not compromised, but it's going to work for everybody. Right. You're trying to keep them in their own box yeah. and then optimize that box. Yeah. So yeah. that would be the difference between your training philosophy here and most of the others that we're going to look at. Right, right. And I think too, like, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I think I was going to provide one other example too, where like a type three is always wanting to go super heavy. So in that case, I might give them a, an exercise, like a muscle snatch that they can still go heavy on, but it's not going to destroy them. Whereas, you know, like trying to make it another, another example, I, I would agree with, I would agree with what you're saying too, because it's like, I, th I think in the realm, like with my football guys, I think there's I think there's an argument that you can even make that that there's position specific groups that tend to not always but they tend to be more of a specific type of athlete uh relative to just lumping them all into one box. I think we always lump them into like position like quarterbacks should always train like this. Well no, quarterbacks should train like this cuz usually they are type ones. Mm -hmm. You know, and Maybe looking at you know, then then there's other areas. A D tackle, they're almost always type three. They're always like the I'm gonna destroy you type guy. So I think it's I think it's recognizing that we know that psychology has a negative Im or can have a negative and a positive impact on how someone's physiological adaptation occurs. But no one is implementing that in an applied setting. We we've seen it in research. And we've seen it like at the university level, they'll talk about it, but no one's saying, well, what, what do we do with that as a coach? How the fuck am I supposed to apply this? It, what you're writing in this paper means nothing to me if there's no application to start with, I think. Have you seen athletes go from one type to another type throughout an annual plan? I've never seen that. And I've asked Dr. B that. And, and some people have, some of my athletes have argued with me about that. Um, 
more <laughs> they want to be in a well, yeah they, they don't want to be type two anymore <laughs> uh, more so more so along the lines of i had one one kid argue that he was he was a type three all day um and as he was maturing and you know 24 25 he was starting to see the the bigger picture and he was more of a type one and it was like no, you just want to be a type one, but you're still a type three. Like you still get frustrated when you, you know, a type one, if they have like using a, use a bench press, for an example, a type one, if they get out of the groove a little bit on a, on a bench press, they might rack it and then redo that set. They're starting back mm -hmm. at square one to get the groove established. A type three, they miss that groove. They don't care. They're, they're still adding weight to the bar. And, and I think that, using you know i would use that example with him specifically i think it's very hard he was essentially saying and this is an a, a i think a reasonable debate of like if you have a child or you get you know you deal with a tragic event or something there could be a switch and i think there there still could be i'm not saying it's like this yeah you know no this is the law of it but i think that for the most part it's unlikely because it's so ingrained in us most of our 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 management of stress and our management of of psychological uh, stre uh it, whatever stress really comes back to how we were raised and how our parents taught us how to handle our stress and to override all of that work up till the point of like 18 to 20 years of age of of our parents ingraining this is how you manage your stress it's it's hard to override that like deep down inside. So I, I, I don't know if that would actually be a, I wouldn't think it, it would happen. I haven't seen it. So with that in mind, are you seeing more type two now than you have in the past? I think that's a really, really good question. And I think that, so I think where I'm at personally, I'm in such a good situation with athletes where I get athletes that, that want to come train with me or train at the gym, right? Train with us because they want to go to the Olympics. They want to go to the NFL. They want to become an All-American. So they're they're so motivated. And there's not a there's not a lack of those people. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's funny you when you messaged about the cold. I was gonna respond and be like, dude, our I you know, our gym, it's like we heated it with a wood yeah. stove and a coal stove. It's like if you walked into the gym, like you don't really get the feeling of like, you just get weeded out very quickly. So like, I'm in a situation where I'm pulling from a population that might not be represented representative yeah. of of the general population. Um, and I think that even the kids, you know, even the kids that we get, like, I'm, dude, we'll have some sixth, seventh, eighth grade kids, and this dude, they still train five days a week. I don't think that's a normal kid. I don't, I, 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 and I think that's why I'm, I don't see it as much because we're getting either super motivated kids or we'll get kids whose parents are more financially stable and they've either done a really good job of raising them and they're going to be held accountable or they've done a really bad job of raising them and they disappear after two weeks. Yeah. <clears throat> so it's, it's like, it's funny you as you as you asked that I thought about maybe I should visit like the the gym churn rate is the gym churn rate higher than it was like eight years ago to see if like those people you know those kids that maybe if they're softer if they churn if they, there'd be a higher churn rate but we haven't seen it I haven't seen it as much. Um, that's I asked because that's been an interesting conversation that I've had with a lot of different people on in regards to the kids are softer today than they were years ago, and which has been an argument that was made to me when I was growing up compared to people above. So yeah, it's kind of a cyclical thing where at the bottom level, probably, mm -hmm. you know, I don't think there's any debate about that, but when you're dealing with people that are at the top level, say the top 10%, mm -hmm. you know, the, the question I always ask back is if that bottom level is, is lower than it's always been, I believe the top level is higher than it's ever been. 100%. Yeah. You know, so if that's the case, then, and that's all that you're seeing, then, when we're looking at strength and conditioning and athletes and how they develop over a period of time, it's better than it's ever been. Yeah. You know, so the top 10% is still the top 10%. Yeah. And it's higher. It's getting better because the research is better. The application is better and, and the technology is better. 
and understanding motivation is better. The coaching is better. Coaching is better. Yeah, yeah. It's, I, it's funny because we got a, a group of pro day guys that are, are prepping and they train their second session. I'll have them train with high school kids. And we've got a kid in eighth grade that he's like six, four, and, you know, just he's a fast track to a power five school. Um, and hopefully he plays for Penn state and has 10 touchdowns against Ohio state. And we can finally <laughs> beat Ohio state. Uh, but yesterday he's, he's lifting with the pro day guys. And the one pro day guy's like, he's from Georgia state. And he goes, how old is this kid? And I was like, yeah, he's 14. And he's like, he's 14. <laughs> like, dude, they build them different today. And it's, and it's funny because exactly how you just described that. I think it, it's actually, it's 100% accurate is that the top 10% is constantly going to be getting better because of the coaching and because of everything that goes into that, that development. So. Well, I think the other dynamic that could be happening is <clears throat> when, when I came up and when you came up, this is a false assumption, but let's assume you had to compete with a hundred other, everybody else in school, you had to compete with them to be able to start and make your place. Where now, if most of them are just fat and out of shape and don't care and they're unmotivated, then you have to compete with less people. Yeah. yeah. So if you have a good work ethic and you give a shit, your ability to actually get to the top 10% is, should be greater. Yeah, you have a response quicker. Than it's ever been. I think there's two, there's two parts of that. You have a faster response immediately which will carry you through. And the other thing is, I think with social media, you can see what other people are doing. And so like throwers are so like so dialed in on what other throwers are doing. They see it on their story. They'll see what their lifts are. That Then you can see, like you can see Joe Kovacs back squatted 400 kilos for a triple. And you know, yeah, he's 30 years old when he did this or however old he is now, right? But as a high school shot putter, you know, if you want to be one of the best shot putters of all time, you have to eventually squat really fucking heavy. And I think that that's another aspect that, that's a positive of social media. And I think that if you've got that top 10% motivation and you've had that early carrot because there's so many schlubs now, um, I think the social media sort of pulls people through that are that 10 percenters. The 10 percenters are, yeah, maybe they use social media to watch Beyonce dance, but they're also using it to see what the best of their sport are doing. Do you find that also puts them in a position to where they want to go heavier than when you want them to yeah. do? <laughs> yeah. Cause they want to, they want to have like a Instagram post yeah. or something yeah. stupid. It's like, I think that's one, it, that's a, that's a freaking, uh, that, I, I think as a coach, I think you've got to play the game in that regard of like, how can I, positively manipulate i'm sure somebody's gonna say oh you shouldn't manipulate kids but that's bullshit you influence should. yeah influence okay there we go um it, it, i think if you can if you can use it and i'll say like i'll try to set up uh scenarios of of having one athlete here one athlete there if he hits this i'll post it on the garage strength instagram or put it on the story or um, I'll text it to your mom so she can post it on Facebook and let all of her friends know that her son's stronger than everybody else. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like the, that is, it is accurate where they do want to go. They do want to go heavier more than, than they, than they should. I also think that's why kids, there's some kids like that are stupid strong in high school now compared to when we came up because of that. How has your training evolved since you've been doing this over the past? what decade yeah so for me i think the you know the biggest thing the biggest change that i had was when i came back from training with dr b i wanted to just really really keep with what dr b was doing and i noticed in my own individual training so i i was training myself still throwing um and, and adding back in more and heavier weightlifting and heavier lifts i started to find a balance between like the more explosive movements and being stupid strong and I think that I've sort of come back into the center almost of that like specificity spectrum, I guess, of being like, okay, what lifts are really specific to specific sports? And I think that's where I'm at now is like, I try to identify specific strength characteristics based off of sport type. So I, I think it's important to identify a sport and what type of sport it is. And then what are those like, top three characteristics of that sport and then what lifts push those those characteristics in that sport and i think that 
I think that there's more bodybuilding in my training now than there than there ever was before. And I think that there's more I think that you know, I I I I think that's that there's also just heavier lifting, you know, I think more so than there was ten years ago, twelve years ago. Well, it's a, when you're talking about and this is something that I was solidified as I went through West Side is you know, you have the maximum you have max after method dynamic. So you got absolute strength and then dynamic strength. Then there's a continuum mm -hmm. that's in there where <clears throat> some athletes fall more on one side than the other, but some sports pull more on one side than the other. So there's that different dynamic that falls in there with that, where say you have somebody that's super explosive, you can't let them get lot less explosive. Yeah. That's a problem. Yep. But if they're weak at the same point, mm -hmm. you need to get them stronger because that will make them more explosive, but not to the point where that can compromise their, explos their explosiveness. Yeah, so yeah. there's that, balance that's in there <laughs> so the movements as you said will kind of change yeah based upon what's going to push in either direction because i don't think anybody's ever too explosive no right but yeah. um and as they age that becomes a bigger problem where one of the biggest pushbacks we always had with the dynamic work was after a certain age an athlete just can't get more explosive so my my circle back to that was but they can lose a step right 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 so if we just keep them yeah. where they were and don't let them lose a step then we'll be okay yeah so there's the compromise because i still think they can't yeah but yeah and there's the compromise with that now that may not mean they have to do extraordinary means to be able to maintain that right if that other secondary part is off right right, right. the trick becomes what movements are going to have that correspondence, which kind of goes back to Dr. B. Yeah. Like, yes. where is that correspondence? Yep. And I don't think that it's as simple as people make it. Right, just right. Throw a heavy dumbbell. Right. right. There, there's right. other means, mm -hmm. and it may not just be that correspondence you're looking for. You know, it could be the motor unit recruitment or a multitude of other things. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is when, when I used to consult with football strength coaches, in a way, I kind of did what you just said is I would circle with them and because if they've been doing it for two decades, they got a lot of shit figured out. Yeah. There's just certain pieces they don't. So I would ask them, you know, what three things have they seen carry over to their athletes on the field? And I made it simple, like what three movements, right? Because in powerlifting, squat, bench, and deadlift, and Olympic weightlifting, snatch, clean, and jerk. Right. That doesn't necessarily mean those are the only things you're going to do to drive those lifts. But they're the main. But they're the main yeah. thing, yeah. right? So anything you do should drive up the main thing. Otherwise, right. the training's not optimal. Right. And so they could tell me a 10-yard sprint, whatever it's going to be. Cool, fine. Then what builds that? Yeah. Then there comes your movements. You know, it just kind of falls down from that. Where in the different sports that you've worked with, what are those indicators that you're trying to drive for specific sports? Pick wrestling, for instance. Okay, I was just going to say, for me, if I would look at, so if, if, if I would take wrestling, right, and I look at wrestling here, and then, and then let's say like something totally opposite. I mentioned swimming earlier, but let's use like field hockey. Um. I would lump wrestling as a combat sport, and then I would come down and say, okay, combat sports will use, um, like, first step is key. If I can be as explosive as humanly possible, um, this would be how much force can you put out in a very short period of time? So that would be, like, an uh, impulse, like, how much impulse can I put out very quickly? So that's one aspect of combat sport. The next aspect of a combat sport is, can I have, um, you could call it sustained endurance, like a, like a scramble in wrestling would be 20 to 30 seconds. Can you handle a scramble and put out a large amount of force? And then the third aspect would be basic conditioning. Like conditioning's king. If, if I'm down 5-1, or especially in freestyle wrestling where you can score so quickly, or even now in, in folk style at the collegiate level, they have a three-point a three takedown now. It's not two points. So I could be down seven to one, but go into a third period. And if I have better conditioning than you, I can make up that pretty quickly. Yeah. So if we looked at that, I mean, you have to be as explosive as possible. You have to have this, in, this like sustained endurance where you're still strong, you're still explosive, but you have a, you can handle a scramble. And then the, the, the third aspect being 
uh, conditioning, then I, then I look at that and I say, okay, what are these three, these three areas get pushed by? Okay, as explosive as possible. For me, uh, let's just say a hang power clean or a power snatcher, a two box snatcher, a hang snatcher. Um, if, if you don't do weightlifting movements, you could say a, a trap bar jump or something or, or dynamic effort deadlifts with bands, right? Something like this. If you're doing, so that's one way to treat the explosive part. Then the next part, okay, well, what can I do to build, um, to build that sustained endurance? Okay, so this is where now um, you could do like a plyometric series per se, and that's also going to feed the first thing. Um, you could do maybe higher rep back squats, like sets of set, like six to 10 reps could help with that. And it's a contrast where you've got, you only rest 30 seconds and you got to go do a jump or something that might mimic uh, that, that, that uh, scramble. And then general conditioning. Okay. Are they doing sprint interval work? Are they doing LSD work? What are they doing there? And then it's setting that up and identifying those, those exercises off of that. And then saying, okay, how can we test that? Let's test in the case of the wrestling, wrestling. And I, I do this, I do the strength work for South Dakota state's wrestling team. So we test, okay. 5k what's their 5k time that's going to help with their their conditioning okay what's their best power clean and then what's their best single leg squat or what's their best um single leg squat or or even like a, for the scramble maybe uh, a sprint interval work on an assault bike uh repeated effort you know to help with that scramble uh association essentially and then it's like who who has a poor 5k time uh, who has a very weak, they're not super, super twitchy, and then trying to figure out off of that piece how to develop each one specific to combat. Wrestling is under the combat umbrella. Those are the three areas for combat athletes that I think that you can increase. And then these are the some of the just the basic movement patterns that I think fuel those three strength characteristics. And then if we would do that for a sport like field hockey, it might be, okay, field hockey, super explosive if you're hitting if you're actually moving the ball okay so that they have a similar thing big power output um they're going to be running quite a bit more so they're running almost like a 10k a game so conditioning is probably going to be another thing speed slash conditioning i think to a point uh and then there's also typically uh some knee issues um in this case i would say uh that would that could be a potential it's ironic i actually think they're pretty similar to to the wrestling example and we might test like their single leg squat for like a set of five um and then build off of that for build that system off of that but it's like now if i look at it i go i have the tests here the tests are fed by the exercises the exercises are created for the strength characteristics the strength characteristics are based off of the type of sport is the sport under this umbrella now is that developed concurrently or are you putting separate blocks for each one of those abilities concurrently yeah concurrently does that make sense like, yeah no okay. it makes total okay. sense it's when i hear things like that then my brain goes to you know some will block i want to know and some yeah. will concurrently yeah. develop those at the same time i think especially in a sport like wrestling i think it i think it's i think it's sometimes you'll see and i think too there's a point where if like okay so there's a kid Clay Carlson, he's an All-American from South Dakota State, and I'm, I'm, I know I'm pointing at this table. Maybe I should stop, but I'm like thinking about it as I'm writing, as I'm like writing on my brain. Talk with him on the phone all the time last year. Okay, coaches call me. Clay's a dog. He's not super athletic. He's not super coordinated. So the whole season, he's got conditioning. He's got. He can scramble. But if he he's like the kid that gets ankle picked and just goes right to his butt. Like he he's not twitch, he's not quick um on his feet. So the whole focus was to get Clay's jumps and to get his his any explosive movement that we could get at, even like an auditory command, like back squat, give him a give him a clap and he's gotta drive up really fast. Doing a lot of plyometric work. So it's like I know that even if we're doing uh conditioning work here in in Clay's example, we need to push a lot uh, of his of his explosiveness. And so it's like, in that case, it wasn't as concurrent because he was so bad with the explosiveness. Yeah, so in, in any case, you're going to prioritize yeah, wherever yeah, they're the, yeah. 
who there is sucked the most. Yeah, now, yeah, now that's what I was going <laughs> to say. No, Clay did get fifth at NCAAs last year. He's not a bad athlete, but yeah. relative to his other performance standards, and I think that's a big thing to keep in mind with athletes too. Is like, where are these performance standards on the the spectrum of the of the benchmarks? So that's the other thing when we test. We've got benchmarks for if you want to go to the Olympics, if you want to be an NCAA All-American or an NCAA champion, if you want to be a D1 athlete, if you want to be a D2, D3 athlete, or if you want to just start varsity. We've got benchmarks laid out for every athlete that we've had get to that point in your specific sports. And if if we test a high school kid, we can say like, look, this is where your numbers are right now. You want to be a state champ and you're not even at like JV numbers. Because I think that's another way of putting reality in front of them too and be like, okay, now this is the recipe. You got to train four days a week and hold yourself accountable to show up. So I think that's that the benchmarks, the testing, the strength characteristics, all the identification of the sport should play into the psychological aspect of how you're motivating your athletes too. Well, the benchmarks can help as well because they may already have certain ones mm -hmm. accomplished. So that's going to be less prioritized. Yeah, exactly. In the system. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Where in the flip side of that, with a lot of athletes that are going to train themselves or a lot of coaches that train the athletes, some of those benchmarks are freak numbers and they want to push them to be more freak numbers. Right. Right. But yeah. It's not going to help them in the long run with right. that correspondence because the shitty ones are, are so sh bad. Are so bad. Right. Right. And that's a hard pill for a lot of coaches and athletes to swallow because they don't want to do what they suck at. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. 100%. Yes. Now, if you have, you know, listed benchmarks, that helps ease that blow mm -hmm. because they can see the path. Like these people all had this. Yep. I already have that. I have that. I don't have these. Yeah. Then that can change their motivation. Going back to the level of athletes. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. The, the level three yep. is going to hate the fact, yeah. you know, that they suck at certain things. That they have to front squat more in my case. It was like I, I couldn't clean worth a shit. And and I couldn't I hated front squatting. I sucked at it, but I knew I had to do it if I wanted to increase, let's say, my jerks. And I knew if I saw an increase in my jerk, I would have a better increase from my standing throw in the shot. If my standing throw increased, then my full throw would increase. And it's like a simple formula. But if you don't have those dots connected, you're, you're not gonna front squat. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. Right. Yeah. Or exactly. you're gonna look for reasons how they don't connect. Yeah, yeah. You're gonna try you're gonna have a confirmation bias. Oh, here. I would. Yeah. hundred yeah, percent. Yeah. I don't wanna do this. No, something else will work better. <laughs> yeah, Especially if it's something I really don't want to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There has to be a better way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right? But if you have that stable and all those numbers ahead, uh huh, then there's really no other choice. Right. And with the athletes you have coming in, that sh does that motivate them? Yeah, for sure. And I think that that's a cool part. You know what's interesting when we were talking about this outside about the the business side is that when I started to think about business stuff on how we could grow our company and like educate coaches better I started to create this system of like the testing and the benchmarks and the and the strength characteristics and it was always in my brain but I had never like put it down and then when we started to like lay it out it was like this is better it's a better training system so it's like oh well i'm trying to be a better coach i'm trying to be a better business owner so i can actually pay my fucking bills <laughs> but then over here it ends up feeding that system because now it makes it so much easier to comprehend and now you get a kid in seventh grade and it's like yo nick singleton's a starting running back at penn state when he was in seventh grade you know you just told me you want to be a starting running back at a power five school when he was in seventh grade he did this all right you want to hold yourself accountable or not and it makes it it makes it so much clearer. The path is so clear for a kid, for an athlete, uh, for the parents who come in and think their kid's going to be a number one draft pick. Are there any benchmarks that you had previously that you no longer use? Um, actually, I, th I think for us, it was like we use single leg squats quite a bit. And and when we first started to do this, we we weren't measuring single leg squats as much. And now we use them way more because we just see them transfer so well to, to locomotion to like to 40s and to 10s and to, and, and to even to jumps and to pulling too. I think they actually help with pulling. Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, anything bad. I, I, I probably try to block that out of my memory, but yeah, I, I, I'm sure there's something. If I went back and looked through our Google Drive, I would find something that we've sort of removed um as far as how we how we identify those benchmarks but i think it's 
it's basically those three strength characteristics that identifying that for each sport and then tying benchmarks to that. What have been some of the biggest hurdles of you trying to get other coaches to do the work for you? Because you you're not working with every athlete now, right, correct? Right. Without throwing any coaches under the bus, because that's just part of business that some people are going right. to work, some aren't. Yeah. I think mm. for us, it's like, uh, I, I think it's it's executing the test effectively, not telling the, the athlete that they're being tested. I think sometimes it's better to not know that you're being tested. Um, I think in some cases, too, um, I, I, I don't. So your testing is inter integrated into the I program. Like to, yeah, I like to do it where it'd be like actually today. So one of the pro guys, pro day guys, came in t today, and I messaged our guy that's that's running them today, um, and I said, okay, this is what they're doing for their upper body lift. I want to see this, and I want to see his five rep, his five rep max on bench, and then I want to see and make sure you take note of when we do the drop sets. We do two drop sets, and the group that's already been tested, they have the same drop sets. But when you test, on, when you do the drop set, this this specific guy has to do the drop set at 225. And I want you to take note of how is he breathing, when is he breathing, what is he doing to set up, and see how many reps he gets. But don't tell him that he's being tested. But then the spreadsheet, you know, we can show that to him afterwards. Like, okay, he thought he was just coming in and just going through the normal routine because everybody's going to do this normal routine. Uh, to warm up and, and to test their explosive push up and then to test their uh to to do the drop sets of bench so he's seeing what everybody else is doing but not knowing that that's actually his test so for that guy the drop sets being tested would more be the so test. than the absolute yeah strength. well the 5 rm can can play a role in the test and then the downfall here is that he will be fatigued on the 225 yeah. rep but it's also like understanding that's part of that like i think the 5rm if we can increase that um because a lot of these guys are coming off of like a four to six week layoff or they just had a bowl game so they're still not training for like two to three weeks so it's like they're going to be fatigued one way or the other um and not to get too into that but it's like i i think that i think that's a better way to test i think some some of the issues i have with some of the issues I have with the on-site, the coaches that work for us on-site is accountability in the, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I want to go into like super specific detail now that I'm thinking about it. Well, I think then, they do the, a good job though. Let's spin, it, let's spin it a little different way because where I'm trying to get at is if somebody's going through your materials and they're trying to implement that okay. with the athletes they have, mm -hmm. you know, what are going to be the pitfalls that they're going to have in that process? I think the biggest pitfalls, pitfalls that you'll see is people will waste an entire week of training just to test somebody. And it's like, yo, if we're testing a vertical jump, why not warm them up? And do jumps for warm ups and test their vertical jump in their warm up. Like, just do that. And then after that, oh, because we use, we're doing a depth drop off of a 12 inch box into a bound. So I want to see how well they can project. How well can they handle when they do the depth drop? Use that as their warm up. Don't waste an entire day to just test their vertical jump and their depth drop to abroad. That's just, it, it's a waste of time, especially when we're looking at it like parents are spending money. Or in this case, if I've got pro day guys coming in or combine guys coming in, we've got 10 weeks. Wasting an entire week to just test to me is a total waste of time when you can get it done at the same time. So I think from the aspect of, an, of you know, somebody who would, who would get my stuff and then try to implement it directly, it's like, all right, look, do this all, try to figure out how to intertwine this. And you can do two to three tests a day for four days and you can get it all done. You know, in a, in a, let's say we're training legs because we'll set it up like the first day of the week, we're doing some type of clean or some type of snatch depending. And usually it's, it's an easy clean. They can test a clean, then they can test a back squat max or five rep max or a single leg squat for a triple. And that can be their first test. It's okay that we're not in like, you know, I think people try to like make the test like this stale environment, but it's like, we just need feedback. We need constant feedback. We're not in a we're not in a college lab, you know. Well, yeah, well, if you're conjugating all this too, right? You know, you're not linearly peeking into something, right? Exactly. And so it's, I I get where you're coming from with that. 
Now, with this guy that's being tested today, if that falls short of where he should be now, right, then where do you look first? Do you look at lifestyle? Do you look at nutrition? Or do you look at the training? Or do you just adjust based upon the fact that it fell short? I think in this case, it's a little different because he's, he's, he's coming off the season. So it's a baseline. Yeah, it's more of the baseline. Now, he did come back from being in Miami, Florida. And <laughs> nothing against Miami, Florida. But I guarantee you, for the last 10 days, he's been drinking yeah. and partying. And it's like, now he also knows the expectation now is, look, you got 10 weeks to essentially set yourself up for your dreams. And you better not fuck this up. You better not waste time getting drunk or uh, going to bed late or anything like that. We've got 10 weeks to do as much work as possible and for you to recover and adapt as well as possible. If we see that he hasn't improved from a baseline test now, and in five weeks, we're just doing a random explosive push-up test or we're having a, another five RM check-in or something like that, and it's the same, there's a problem. Either the system's horrific or he was out, you know, with a hooker last night or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah something stupid. What, what does that typically be lifestyle or i think it's almost always lifestyle i think that's the biggest factor it's like it's like what time are you going to bed um what what are you doing during the day what are you eating i think there's there's some there's some people that like some kids some especially if you're working with like like d-back safeties they're leaner individuals already they don't realize they're not eating they don't realize that like dude you got like 80 grams of protein in yesterday like they don't understand that 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 that's that they've got to hold themselves accountable just on the simple stuff. Um, I mean, even I'm, I'm a big fan of using the sauna for recovery because we're doing so much volume on a day-to-day -day basis with these guys. So it's like, you know, you've got to get in the sauna five days a week. We've got to make sure that, that you're eating as much protein, if not more than, you know, around one gram per pound of body weight. It, just using simple, the simplest guidelines that I think our high school kids know how know what they're doing but if they're outside of our system most of these guys haven't been exposed to that you know they haven't been brainwashed to be like this is the protein intake this is how much sleep you've got to be getting this is how much mobility work you've got to be doing these are the problem areas that you have as an athlete this is the problem area that are tendencies in your sport. And this is how frequently you have to do it it's, for the next 10 weeks. This is all you're doing. You're not doing anything else. You're not playing Zelda. You're not playing Call of Duty. You're not doing anything else. That's it. And, and what is, what is the compliance when they come in with that? How much do they comply? Yeah. I mean, if somebody new coming in, I'm going to assume that the compliance is going to be fair yeah, until they have the second test. Yeah. And yeah. then it will improve. Yeah. I would say... 70 to 80 percent which i think is probably above average i, I think yeah. that's you know the one the one kid had said to me he said uh he was drinking tequila and diet cokes because he thought that would be better before he came into training uh and he was like so sh should i avoid that at all it's like the number one line is you cannot like you can't drink you know and i the the, the thing that sort of stinks is like i want to develop the combine group big time in the future like in a decade from now hopefully we could talk about this as like this huge thing um but i want to get to the point where it can be like yo if you, if i find out you're drinking i'm calling your agent and and we're figuring out like dude you're not doing this like you you got to go to another group um but i think right now to answer your question it's like uh 70 to 70 to 80 percent and then i th i think the people some of the guys that come in they they find me to be a little bit intimidating so they do follow it more so than you would than you maybe would think i guess um and then on the second half it's like yo now you know you have to follow us because you feel like shit for the first four weeks with your combine guys now are they agent are the agents paying or are they personally paying but these are just all pro day guys so they're all personally paying out of pocket right. yeah well that's a different it's a different it's a different athlete yeah yeah and that's the thing these are guys scrapping yeah these are guys that are like they've got like a very fine line to make it you know they're not the heisman they're not Jaden. i think it's Jalen, mm. Jaden daniels they're not that guy they're, they're not guaranteed top 10 picks you know so i think that that's like another thing too it's like you have to be and i think i think this is the this is actually uh my thought process is that a training system has to be focused on developing the most normal person possible and and if you can identify this is a normal person if 
everything in your system is developing as normal, uh, the most normal Joe Schmo possible. If everything is built off of developing that person, that's how you create a great system. And I think that then, you know, then you do have a Heisman Trophy winner or somebody like that that you put into that system and they just blow up even more. So it's like these normal guys, I mean, they're not normal guys. They're, they're high level guys, you know, all conference, but they're not, they're not guaranteed, you know, projected picks. So it's like they have every little thing you've got to wring out of them as much as you can. Otherwise you're screwed. Actually, somebody, yeah, somebody, I think it was Teddy Bruschi was actually talking about Bill Belichick like that. Like you think about a towel filled with water and you wring out every single drop. That's what, that's what Bill Belichick does as a coach. And I think that's what, what, if you build a good system, that's what your training system should be doing if it's deployed and it's, and your guys are following through as, you know, as, um, if they're holding themselves accountable to execute every single aspect as well as you possibly can. So when they come in, what metrics are you using to train them to actually make them better players? So, so you would say, assuming they don't suck. Yeah. Yeah. Assuming they know the plays and they know what they're doing. I think. So for me, I guess my question Okay, so if I would look at like the combine test, or if they're going to pro day, they're going to do a three uh, L cone, they're going to do shuttle, they're going to do forty, um, they're going to do bench, uh, vertical, broad jump. Those are the key aspects to make them better. Yeah. Um, we have to develop and break for down. the combine. Yeah, for yeah, yeah, it's better <laughs> for the combine. Yes, I think to a point, um, breaking down you know, looking at like a 40 and saying, okay, what's going to apply the most? Probably a 10, um, probably a 10 and some sled work. Uh, but then also three days of field specific work where they've got to go out and work on their, their field specific technique. If they're a linebacker, how, or if they're, their safety, how well, how much speed can they apply, uh, backpedaling? And I think that's actually one thing where we're still trying to develop those qualities of, okay, yes, we have to cater. We have to train towards these tests. We have to master the technique of these tests, Um, but we still at the same time can help developing develop how well can a can a a safety backpedal and get out of that cut based off of coverage, based off of if they're in zone, you know, what based off of man to man, whatever it is that they're running. I I would say that's still a priority in the training system when you're developing like a pro day a pro day type guy. So how's that implemented within a training week then? So I'll have uh, Monday, Wednesday are double days. Their easier days are going to be Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. So I want them to go field days, Tuesday, Thursday, and then they're going to pick either Saturday or Sunday as another field day. So Monday or Sunday, we train as well. It's an easy lift on Sunday. Saturday, we're entirely off. So typically, they would go field day work on Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, or Sunday, Tuesday, Friday, something like that. Now, how does this work if you have that group going in there, but then you have all these other athletes doing other things as well? So if I go... Do you try to integrate them? I go... My day would would be uh, film YouTube videos from 8 o'clock till 9.45. Once a week, we got a business meeting. Well, more than once a week, but my main meeting is 9.30 till 11. At 11 o'clock... and I don't really run the business anymore. We have another person that does that. 11 throwers come in. The throwers are doing their warm up while I'm in the meeting. And as soon as the, I'm done the meeting, I go out to the throw circles, which are at the gym. Throwers throw from 11 till 12.15. At 12.15, we come in. And then at 12.15 or at 12.30, that's when the football guys start. Football guys train. Then when they're done, I'm eating or I'm working out or doing something like that. Three o'clock. They're going to either do another lift or that's when the weightlifters come in. So then it's like around 3.30, 4 o'clock until 5.30, then I go home. All right, so you got to segment it out based yeah. upon sport. There's some carryover between throwing and football, football, weightlifting, but there's no true carryover with throwing. The throwers almost never carry over to the weightlifters unless a guy has a job and he has to come in in the afternoon. That's the only time. So which group stays in there <clears throat> more consistently over a period of time? Because the throwers, ball, the throwers are there all the time. Yeah, and the throwers are year are year round. Weightlifters are year round. The thing with the throwers is there's more of a season. Weightlifting's like this constant. The next one's the next comp. 
Um, I mean, high school football kids are year round, but the the pro day guys, it's maybe ten to twelve weeks max, mm -hmm. and then they're gone. So you have the high school kids in season too. It depends on the high school yeah. coach. Some high school coaches hate hate that you know they hate that they would come to my gym. Um, but we've got a pretty good group where it's like we've gotten people to understand that they should be lifting in season a minimum like a saturday or a sunday and then like a tuesday if they have a game on friday or maybe a wednesday if they're playing a crappy team um but for the most part yeah that would i would say football's a little iffy in season all right so then with the weightlifters are you trying to push them all into the same meets Yes, I cannot stand. I have to come out to the fucking Arnold dude again, and I can't. I can't stand going to so many different meets <laughs> and and travel. It's like, uh, it, it's it's the most. I mean, it's probably like powerlifting. It's the most unforgiving, like low reward level. It's just so miserable, and it's such a hard. It's it's exactly like powerlifting. It's such a hard sport. To be good, you've got to train constantly. And the reward is is so it's so hard to to just to be good. And then you've got to travel all these freaking meets. But for me, it's like, yo, I'm going to these basically nationals, world championships if, if somebody makes it, uh, Olympics if somebody would make it, um, and then maybe a Grand Prix and 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 the the sub national level meet I would go, I go to is basically the Arnold, which is just a total chaotic event. Like, well, unlike the other sports, they have to peak as well. Yeah. So when you have people peaking at different times, it's kind of a, it's a pain in the it's ass. It's a pain in the ass. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's also a pain in the ass. I think the hardest part is like, as a coach, if, if you're setting up a big peak and you, and you have someone who doesn't peak well or you think you fuck something up as a coach in weightlifting, I'm always like, what did I, what did I do? And I'm like, yeah, I have like a two-day depressive period. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, and I, then I'm like, am, am I doing something to the throwers? Did I screw up something with football? And then it's like, what am I? I think that's the, the emotional side of it is so brutal. Um because in a sport like like weightlifting or like powerlifting, I feel like there's just so much emotional investment in the athlete from the coach and vice versa that it, it can be, dude, it's draining. It's a lot. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, so hard. It's draining me right now. I need to take a piss, take a break. <laughs> <laughs> just thinking about it. <laughs>
just can't dial in. You're dealing with injuries. You're trying to figure out how to better optimize your training. All the stuff you're seeing on social media is confusing and all you need is a little guidance and support or just somebody to look at your lifts to make sure that they're either heading in the right, right direction or if there's a weak point in the lift, they can point out what that weak point is. Well, that's what we have the crew for. So when you join the crew, you get an extra Table Talk podcast each month called The Crew Cast. You also get access to our Discord community, which has a training Q&A, form checks with top coaches, mindset section, nutrition, training logs, programs, over 30 ebooks, plus exclusive ebooks just for the crew, webinars, lectures, seminars, giveaways from ranging from full strength equipment. We've given away many yoke bars this year. We've given away actually pieces of strength equipment as well as accessory items and you get exclusive crew discounts. So go to the link in the description that says join the crew, click it, Join now and start getting stronger today. All right, guys, we've got a new limited edition drop, the original Mountain Dog Tee that John Meadows had us design from the very beginning. So it's the first tee that he had made. Once again, this is a limited edition item. So when they're gone, they're gone. While I have your attention, you've seen me wear this one in a few podcasts to date. We've been holding back on it. This here, the four star tee, I think that's what we call it. It's on the website new items also under limited edition check out our shoulder saver pads it's an easy way to do limited restricted range of motion exercises like board press that basically you just pop the pad on the bar reduces the range of motion pop it back off when you're done thank you guys for the support head over to eliteftfs.com did you found the gym in 2010 uh 08 so 08 and that started in your parents garage right yeah yep yep so, and that was coming straight back from Canada. Yep. So how many clients did you have? Two. Actually, uh, Jason, who's here, he was like probably my, my second official client. I had a guy, I had a, my junior high wrestling coach brought me his son. Then Jason came and then I had a woman who just came in for like weight loss. And then it just started from there essentially well essentially right so i want to dig into the essentially because you come back and you think you're going to start this thing Mm -hmm. and and did it blow up or was it a grind from the start it was a grind from the start it was like i came back i lived at home um i was dating my wife and you know she went to school got a master's degree she was a teacher all that stuff Uh, so she did like the route that that is you're supposed to take um and then for me it was i had like those first couple of clients and then it was very very slow uh and then i had one kid who was he just like you know at the time jason was younger uh and he ended up being a state champ and the whole time i thought as many state i want to cha- train as many state champs that i can anybody who co- would come through my door i want to make them a state champ um and part of that was I was a state champ in PA for track and it was like, it was a great emotional experience for me as a 17, 18 year old kid. It's like, that's something that I wanted to to help people achieve. Right. So it's like, I had one kid that got really good at wrestling and then my wrestling group like blew up. Um, and I got to the point, I want to say it took me about two years of being in my parents' garage, which was like, you know, the first point of it was 400 square feet and then my dad let me take over the the other part which is 800 total square feet um so what was in there at the time so what did you have to work with i had one platform i had a jailhouse squat rack and a jailhouse incline bench um and an old squat rack in the corner trying to think through the old videos and like a beat up york glute ham um ghd and a couple dumbbells. I bought some dumbbells that were that were salvaged, um, and that was it. That was all that was in there. And then it was and boxes. I had two boxes. Um, You're so excited about the boxes. Yeah. Did you build them or something? Yeah, they were all built. You know, I was telling this story earlier. Yeah. They they were the boxes were built, and the 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 platform I got from my dad's high school. They got a new weight room. I bought a bar off of Elite FTS. I want to say in like 2011, 2012, maybe a 
big, huge two and a half inch fat bar. And I remember it was, it was like 800 bucks or 700 bucks or something. And I'm like, all right, I got some money now. Uh, and it didn't show up for like two weeks. And I, it, I honestly think it might've been you who emailed me somebody I, I remember it was someone who i was like oh my god i got an email it was either you or somebody else i know who, or i knew who it was and they were like oh you know this is about it's on back order give us another two weeks i did what I, I wanted to tell you that um because that was like one of my big crowning achievements was buying that that fat bar i big still have the ass fat bar yeah, yeah. 55 mm. pounder mm. um going back for me the big one was um i was working as an in-school suspension monitor and having the gym and i got to the point where i had written down a goal that when i when i could make more from the gym than i was making from that so you know you're looking at like 400 500 bucks of probably 400 bucks a week i i i would quit and uh when i got to that point then it was like all right now i'm all in and then that's when i just started to slave away at the at the at the gym at my parents house at my parents garage and then we just got to the point where it was like Dude, I had no idea what I was doing with business. I didn't know anything about that. I just knew if I trained people and they got good, I, more people would come. So how were you getting the referrals from the people? Word of mouth. It was all word of mouth. I didn't have a cell phone. Dude, I didn't have a cell phone till till 2011, until we moved into my the second location. Once once we moved into the second location then, uh, but yeah, that that's when I, I want to say we might have started Instagram. I had posted a couple times on YouTube uh, on this little camera that we had. Um, and those videos actually, I want to say one or two of them might be like million view videos that, but I had no idea what I was doing then. I was just randomly posting things, uh, on YouTube, but it was all, all word of mouth, never anything outside of that. And then how long did it take to get into the second location? Uh, so we moved there in 2011. Um, so that was three years and my sister was, so my sister, and her husband were going to move back to where we live in PA. They were in DC. And I had this property right around the corner from my parents' house, literally right around the corner came up and there was a barn there. And I was like, yo, I've got a lot of money that I saved up. I had, a, you know, no joke. I had a monopoly bin like this and it had, it had, it was a monopoly tin. That's how I would get payments. It was all cash and checks. And I would just take it and put it in the bank and, and, and save my money. And when my, my sister wanted to move back, I told her about this spot and it was for sale. And I was like, I'll put down a decent amount of the down payment if you let me use the barn. So then we did that until 2017. And then 17, we moved to where we're at right now. And how big was the barn? 2,800 square feet. And then how big is your place now? <clears throat> 10,000 square feet. And now we're trying to move to a, a bigger location now, but it was 17 or in 17, when we moved there, it was huge. It was like, I mean, it was so big moving into that place, uh, 10,000 square feet now seems so small, but at the time it was so big that it, we almost went bankrupt, like literally, um, going into COVID, it was like, we might like my wife might have to go back and start teaching. And, and that's the time when you started pushing your online. Yeah. Yeah. That was when it was like, um, 19. I tried a little bit of that, like coaching online, like doing the, the, like somebody would buy a program and write coaches, uh, write coaches, write programs, 18, 19, I'd started to do that and it would help, but it was just like putting a slight bandaid on top of it. You know, I, I, I didn't comprehend business work at all. I didn't comprehend. I was just still, I just wanted to train. And then I realized like, I've got four kids. Like I can't do this. I've got to figure out some way to be a little bit more sustainable long term. So how did you go from just basically PDF file ebooks mm -hmm. to where you apps and programs and all that now? So, dude, that's a that's a very loaded question. Um it started with COVID and really came down to figuring out when COVID hit. So when COVID hit, I actually, I had scoured the internet for John Meadows email. And dude, I emailed him and I'd never talked to that dude. And he, he, he was like, I'll get on a call. Uh, 
that guy talked to me for like three and a half hours. And he's like, well, you're clearly a good coach. He's like, you're a good coach. You have no idea what you're doing with your business. <laughs> um, and I, dude, I just, he was like, you got to go all in on, on, on YouTube for two years and you can't stop. You're like, you, you got to promise you can't stop. And that's what we did. I don't know. I always wanted to tell you this story, dude. Uh, you and, and John Meadows played like a big role in, in where, where I'm at with success. And it, and it means a lot. It, dude, that, that shit means a lot. And I, I don't know how to tell you. Like, I, I never met you before. And uh, that's him. At, he, he impacted me so much. And he's like, take, take your programs. Take all this stuff. Try to sell as much as you can through through YouTube, um, and grow your channel. You know, at the time we had like forty five hundred subscribers, and and I was like, all right, I'm all in. I'm I'm gonna do it. Uh, and I tried to pay him. I was like, yo, can I pay you? He's like, no. Um, so when you started that, that's a grind at the start, yeah. right? Because you got to come up with all these ideas. Well, so that was the, the interesting part. Was like he he sort of gave me like just a blueprint like i dude i had so many and i i i think that's why i get emotional thinking about it one because of what happened with john but also two because it's played such a big role in my and my family's stability um but he was he was like think about it this way what are five things that you would do to get bigger biceps and i i just said something and he's like okay that's a video and as soon as he said that, I was like, oh, shit. What are five ways to jump on a box better? You know, what are five ways to to, uh, to do a walking lunge or something like that, right? Uh, maybe not a walking lunge. That's a bad idea. Don't use that for... Well, it may be one of your videos if I go look, right? <laughs> <laughs> so don't, don't speak ahead of yourself. <laughs> yeah. um, but but he, he, he gave me this light bulb of like how to do that. And it it was a grind. Like the process is... And I, but I think what happened was... And he had told me this. He's like, you can't quit. You gotta, you gotta go. And, I, and he goes, at one point, I did forty days in a row with forty videos, or forty days of a video. So I took that and I did seventy days. But the biggest thing that 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 it did was it created a process for me, and it and it was a process on how to get a an outcome. And then it was like, okay, how can I do that? You know, I it was the first time that I thought about things from a business perspective. Like, this is how much money we're going to put into this. This is what we can get back. And he was like, look, you're, you're clearly, you're a good coach, but nobody knows who you are. Like at that time I had guys, I had guys in the, at the Olympics, I had a guy in the NFL and nobody cared. Like, right. Like that's how you feel like this is stupid. Why doesn't anybody care? But nobody cared. Cause I wasn't doing shit. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think that changed that whole attitude from, the woe is me blame to like, I got to get this done. And also I will say this is like, he I had that meeting and then like, like within like three days, they announced the PPP stuff. And for me, it was like, okay, how can I take $35,000 and turn it into 70 and then, and do that again. And if I'm getting the PPP, I've got to freaking use it and figure out how to make it worthwhile. And I think that that's where it, it played such a huge role of getting people to then buy the PDFs because we, we did a random video and you can look this up on, it, it was February or no, it was, uh, I want to say it was April of 20 on strength training for wrestling. And that was like, that people started to watch that video. Now it took a long time to get to 20,000 subscribers and grow, but people were starting to see like, oh, we got a sale on a wrestling program. And then over a long period of time, it went from, and I emailed John after we hit 100,000 subscribers, and he's like, the only thing he really said was, great work, you, know, you, you put in so much effort. I remember when we talked on the phone during COVID, um, that's awesome. Now see what that next path could be. And I didn't really grasp that. And then later on, the, this guy that works for me, uh, his name's Trevor, he's like, he's like, well, what if we would 
put this all into an app and they and he was like so when we were at the barn in my, the second location i trained everybody all, all the, the whole day everybody he was like what if it's like dane at the barn but it's in somebody's pocket it's in their cell phone and that's what the app could become and so that's when we started to work on that on and it was like a year and a half of developing it now it probably wasn't until we were at like 250,000 subs uh, and subscribers, I don't think does, I don't think it matters. And I, John had said that to me, um, but that's when we really, really started to develop and lay everything out with the app, maybe a little bit sooner than that. But then it was like a year and a half of developing it before we wanted to release it. Um, and what was that process like? It's just like the YouTube process. It's like, okay, how do we meet with a software designer and tell them how my brain thinks, you know? And that's a challenge. And it's like, how do you, how, and then, and then lowering your expectations. Cause like, for me, I've always been like a go, go, go person. And I think everything should get done so quickly. And that's, I think my biggest downfall. I think that's my biggest business downfall has been that is like, we would try so many different things. And I think that's the one thing with the YouTube channel and like, you can see things that don't that don't work and you can see why it doesn't work and then that sort of leaked into how we led into the the business the app development and and the process of meeting with the developers and laying everything out from a very rudimentary aspect of like somebody like how would somebody get to the to download the app what if they're on android um versus iphones and then versus you know they don't have access to the same equipment how are we going to teach them technique and there were so many questions around that and we you know what was interesting is that while we were developing the app we were essentially like really in e-com then so we're in e-commerce and we're selling pdfs and, and it was doing really well we're doing great and we started to think like oh we could we could sell equipment we could sell single leg squat racks and we could sell bands and all this stuff and all the, the e-com stuff was going but then we started we're developing uh the app and the app is in the space would be referred to as SaaS, which is like software as a service, which is a whole nother mindset. And we didn't, we were trying to like develop this the same way we did this. And they're totally different entity or totally different ways of developing it. So I think it's like, and meanwhile, I'm trying to train everybody and, and then make sure that my wife's not crying because we don't have money. You know, it's like, uh, clearly I'm the one that would be the one crying, not my wife. Uh, but it's like going through those processes. I think it's so, it's so, it's fun to look back on because now it's like, okay, basically it's YouTube channel, YouTube channel sells PDFs. Now, once we get to a point now, this is where we've taken, um, and the YouTube channel we use to sell the books and stuff. And now it's like, okay, now how can we get the, the app to roll and, and make the app better, make it uh, function better, make it more uh, intuitive and, and make it more like exactly how you would train with us if you were training at garage strength on site, you know? So throughout this whole time with, um, as the apps being developed, did you already have the content from your YouTube to be able to support that? Or was it new content you had to develop? It was all new content. So like, that's one thing I'd say too, with, with Trevor's and, and Trevor's like, look, it's gotta be set up this way. It can't be you cross posting in here it's got to be like you're coaching somebody and he would use the example like you're talking to a coach they're behind the camera and they, they or you're talking to an athlete they, there's no persona it's just you it's just your your coaching um and then real simple technique videos how to do a, a clean how to do a bench press how to do a dumbbell bench so that you can see in there and then you know, well, Dane, what do you do if somebody's hurt and they can't bench press and you can click like replace exercise, stuff like that. So it's like all of the content has been totally redone inside of it. It's not. It's, well, that creates more time. Yeah. 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 So it's so during this time frame, you're training athletes, you're still doing YouTube. Yep. Right. You still got to create programs, too. Yep. Because you can't keep selling the yeah, same program. Yeah. And then this as well. So I'm going to guess you're working 100 hour weeks. Yeah. Constantly. And not, and, and I think that's, yeah, that's just where, and at the same time, trying to contribute with the four, with the four kids and, and make sure that my, now, by the time we got to around, probably around 250 subs, like that, 250,000 subs, it was like, we had enough site traffic from the channel that we were, my wife was, not that we were in a great spot, but that my wife was like, okay, now we're in, we're stable. 
we don't have to we don't have to constantly think about how we're going to pay our bills and that's what that, that's what it was before covid it was like i think that was the hardest struggle is like i this was my dream was to be this big time coach and do all this stuff and and get guys to the olympics or whatever and it's like but i couldn't make money you can't do it like i couldn't do it i don't know how people do it outside of like the route that like you have taken or or that i have taken or that anybody else has like there's got to be another thing in unless you're going to coach at the university setting yeah you know then then it's a different a different story that can even be debatable well depending yeah, upon make, the size of the university and what you're getting paid yeah you're not making money in some of those you things. know and it's <clears throat> i see that a lot where you'll have trainers or coaches that are you know in that setting and then they're no longer in that setting then they want to jump over here mm -hmm. but they have no comprehension of how much time yep work and stress it actually is and then they they fail because actually because of that yeah because they don't see that you may have to post one video a day for 70 days but yet your traffic and your subscriptions and your conversions don't go anywhere yeah 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 exactly that was great yeah that's so <laughs> accurate <laughs> I wish Jason was in here because Jason, when we were at the end of the 70 day blitz, we called it, he's like, dude, can we like not do anything for like 10 days? Cause, and, and then you're looking and well, I think the crazy part is at that time we, we knew to measure site traffic, but we didn't know how, like, we didn't know conversion rate. We didn't know like time on website or whatever. Like you don't know any of that stuff. It's just like, you're like, just throwing shit on the wall and seeing what sticks really mm -hmm. yeah so it's like yeah they don't it's funny because you say that about that about collegiate coaches it's like oftentimes it happens where the college coach doesn't even they're not even thinking about youtube videos or how much time goes into that stuff no it's what i typically see is they'll no longer be in that and then they'll just start a paywall of some sort yeah you know and then after a year they have 30 people yeah right? <laughs> yeah yeah and then it's spending a couple hours per day right you know working on that for 30 people then they're like stuck yep because they don't want to lose the 30 people but they don't want to have to do the work to be able to make it grow yeah yep. which is marketing the thing yeah yeah you know on some other network and that other network say if it's youtube it's still hard to figure out what the actual conversion yeah it's really hard. is from that yeah right it's it's like oh, fuck i guess yeah you know you don't really know we use UTM codes, <laughs> mm -hmm. so we try to put that onto a specific video, not to get too too. Yeah, that's how we try to track it. And then it's like at the time with the PDF, what was interesting is like if we would put out a basketball video, if we saw an increase in our basketball sales, we would be like, "All right, well, maybe some basketball kids watch this video and then they wanted the PDF." But then you're getting the PDF delivered to you, and the PDF might not be the cleanest thing that you ever see. And then we eventually want those individuals, because at the time then we're developing the app, and we eventually want these PDF buyers to come over to the app. But then when they get into the app, the app's slower. It's just like constantly playing this. Like it's just like training. It's, it's a, yes. It's exactly like training. Yes. But, but I feel like most most strength coaches that I've talked to, I've, they don't think that way early enough. At least, I mean, personally, I didn't think that way. I didn't think that way early enough. Well, if you look back now, you'll see that, you know, on the on the training side, you have these indicators mm -hmm. to be able to track yeah. what type of athlete it is, yep. you know, what sport it is, you know, what the benchmarks are. It's the same shit. It's the same thing, except when you go to a new thing, you're ignorant. Yeah. It'd be like you just starting as a strength coach and not even knowing what the benchmarks are. Mm -hmm. Fuck, not even knowing what the lifts are. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think that's what pisses me off from individually is that I look back and I, when I'm getting pissed at myself, I, I'd be like, I watched and, and like, do you had like a series like death squats? I think, I think you would do like safety bar squats, such of like 30 reps or something or 35 reps. And I remember consuming all of that stuff and reading your, 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 the blogs and, and, and all of the T nation posts and stuff. And I never thought like you're doing this, one, because you want to help people get better at that. But you're also doing this to set things up. Like, I'm going to contribute in multiple ways. And it took me so long to be like, okay, if I help people with this, it can help me along the way. I was just, I look back and I'm like, why did it take me 10 years from me consuming that good content to then being like, I can do that myself. I think that's where I get pissed and frustrated with my 
individually like i'm i'm you get so one track minded on just training that and i think there's another side where value gets convoluted yeah to where you don't want to put this stuff out here for free because these people are paying you so why in the fuck should i and then that's amplified with a lot of other coaches that will say know your value know your value know your value yeah you yeah. know so then that gets fucked up in your head and you you also see other people put content out and and when you're in a bed like a bad headspace like when you can't pay your bills you're like you see somebody else put out content you're like that guy sucks i don't like his content he's a loser and it's like well no he's at least he's trying to make it work yeah you know like yeah yeah the value part and and yeah yeah looking back on it, it's so frustrating but then you also look back now with a clearer mind and you can you can learn from a lot of those those mistakes and fuck ups yeah and it's again it's a it's a lot like training as well because with that value part you can put that out there and there will be no return right Right. You know, for a long time, then you can get frustrated about that. Yeah. Why in the fuck am I doing all this? Why am I doing all? But when you're training athletes for the first time, you really don't know what you're doing. Yep. Is there really a return there yeah. either? Yeah. You know, and it can be debated if there is. Yeah, it can be very, very debated because I think yeah. Well, we see that with new coaches getting in. Yep. You know, and some of the shit that they'll do, and they're learning. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully they're yeah. learning, but I'll fall back on the ten percent of them will move forward. Yeah, ninety percent will fall out. I think that's that's an interesting thing too. It's like you'll see so where where with success you'll see so frequent people pop onto a scene and fall off. And you know, weightlifting's got a scene, throwing's got a scene. I'm sure powerlifting. They all has, do. Yeah, mm -hmm. you'll see people pop into like throwing a track and field or throw or weightlifting. And they're huge inside that area. And then two, three years later, you don't even like, they just disappeared. It's like, well, they, they never, they didn't find what was sustainable for them to put out and, and to be popular, to be, um, I like to say substantive, like you've got to offer something of value that is a long term past the 10 year test. Like in 10 years are what you, are you offering something? And I don't know if that was something that like John brought up to me in the YouTube videos, but I remember early on being like, if I watch this in 10 years, can I pull something out of it? Um, now, some of my early YouTube videos that we did do during that time frame, they're terrible, but there still might be a nugget of information in there. No, but that's a key point to make because anybody that wants to start doing it, yeah, they're going to be terrible too. Yeah, they're, but yeah. the only reason you get better is by doing more of that. Yeah, and there's <clears throat> Dave Hoff kind of mentioned it from a powerlifting perspective on I think the first podcast we had, where he noticed because he came in kind of after a lot of us were there and then has been there for forever, right? Mm -hmm. And he would see lifters that will they'll, they'll come up and then there's a dip. You know, it might be like a two or three year dip, and then it comes Go up again. Up. Yeah. So he saw that happen so many times that if he hit that, then he started experiencing that dip. It's like, okay, fuck it. I'm just going to ride this out for a couple of years, not do any real stupid shit, just kind of wait for it to pull back up again. Yeah. Where business has that, training has that, competing yeah. has that, everything has that. Most people will quit when that dip happens. Yes. Yeah. And they don't realize that that dip could go deep. Yeah. You know, some people go bankrupt and they yeah. come back. Right. Right. You know, but then it comes back up again because you learn during that process. As long as you're not stupid. Yeah. And like you realize this is this yeah this is part of it this is gonna suck for a while mm -hmm. so just sustain yep you know learn and then get ready for when it comes back up again i think most people just quit yeah yeah and i i mean it's like it's interesting too because sometimes i i i can relate to why they would quit i can't i'm not that no, we all can yeah. because it, those never go away yeah you know they yeah. always come back again it will come back to you at some point again and be like fuck what the hell it's it's funny because with our youtube channel right now it's like and our our app we'll put out really good youtube videos that have very long watch time but they're not like the videos like it okay performance and it's like okay is it the thumbnail is it the title and it's like that sometimes with our with our app it's like why is our our churns up way higher this week and you just i used to be so knee jerky with it like oh what can we do and it's like just keep going just keep doing mm -hmm. this 
try to get better with the small stuff if you can master those fundamentals and just keep chipping away at it just like you would in training and i think that's a hard thing at least personally that's a hard thing for me to to control myself because i want to just like ah i just want to force it to go faster you know so speaking of training over this whole time period you know you've been what 300 pounds yeah or what was yeah, the yeah. heaviest you got three like 300 so 300 pounds and then down yep. now yeah so as you go down obviously the strength isn't the same right right yeah. so how have you navigated your own training over the years i think for me it was like the hardest switch i and i i'm assuming i think you could relate to this is like in a power sport like a strength sport the biggest fear is being small and like being called a bitch for having mm -hmm. small arms or like you, you can't bench you can't bench heavy anymore in the, in the throwing world it's like what are you benching right now it looks like you can't even bench four plates you know stuff like that and i had I, when i started to like around 36 i started to think like all right well like do i really need to train super heavy anymore like I can just start to lean out. I, I really should try and prioritize this. And it didn't, it didn't happen, but I started to think that way. Then my dad gets a defibrillator and my dad has had some, some serious health issues. And that was sort of like, dude, you're almost 40 now. I turned 40 this year. I need to like prioritize longevity. You've got four kids. It's not about you anymore. It's not about like how much you can bench or what you can squat or anything along those lines. Now, don't get me wrong. Like I still want to be well, strong. It's easier said than done. Yeah, correct. Um, yeah. Cause I, it's funny. I made this, I made this, uh, this sort of like goal when I was 36 to start losing weight. And then I had this thing growing out in my neck here and I had to go in for neck surgery. I think he, I think it's right here. There's a scar there. I get I got this thing removed from my from my neck. So I had made this goal. I tell my wife, I I want to do this. And then immediately something starts popping up. I go into the doctors and, and everything ended up being okay, but I had to go in for neck surgery. We had this neck surgery planned. And at the time I could deadlift like 660. And I was like, I, this is it. I gotta, I'm gonna go in for surgery. It's in it's in January. And this was 21. I need to deadlift 700 pounds before I go into to the, the surgery. And she's like, why? You just said you wanted to lose weight. So I'm like, yeah, but this is my lifetime goal. What if something happens during my surgery? <laughs> so I went hard for two and a half months, push up to 705 for a deadlift. And then I think I, I actually will say, I think that helped me sort of move on to like, okay, what's my next lifetime goal? Like, what can I do? And then, then the stuff with my dad started to happen. And it was like, all right, now that's a catalyst. Why don't you start to be a little bit less fat? Why don't you start to focus on longevity and try and get your, try and get your, your health in line. Um, and I would start to do some more like assault bike stuff and, and just a little more cardio and still bodybuilding style, uh, training. So that's basically where I'm at now. It's like, I, I run quite a bit. Uh, I actually ran a Philadelphia marathon, but then I, I, I've been doing some bodybuilding stuff here and there. And so I'm just sort of bouncing back and forth between endurance work and, and lifting and, and I'm not competing bodybuilding, but just help. Do you fight the motivation to train at all? Yeah. I think there's often times that I just want to like go in and start lifting heavy again. But then I, I, I've also had, uh, bad elbow pain and I'm, i and i i've always had once i start to lift pretty heavy it hurts bad and i think that's helping me and it I, does but when you go in and all you're doing is like fucking arm day i mean it's, <laughs> yeah, sometimes how it's motivated are you are to do that yeah you know? yeah no that's the thing is it's it's like you you now you're trying now you're, you're triggering me right now to, to go back and start lifting heavy i think it's like it's different though man it's it's rough it is it's definitely a hard because the other thing i think is it's fun to establish those goals i think where i'm trying to go is like a weight goal and it's like all right if i'm 228 right now i have been down to 217 what if i got back down what if i got down to 215 i don't i've got to deal with that emotionally as like i'm a bitch i don't have big arms anymore but health wise it's probably going to help me longer to to be a healthier individual so i've got to try and value that but i haven't gotten to that point yet where i actually do value the the endurance aspect more than being swole i guess have you found it easier to gain weight or lose weight gain gain weight is so easy dude when people talk about how how hard it is to gain weight i'm like you're such a <laughs> you aren't eating anything like yeah. you know how easy i could drink a gallon of milk in three or four hours like 
That's you know how many calories are in that? Like it's not hard to gain weight. You it's fun to eat food. It's mm-hmm. fun to to shove food down your face. So I always find it easier the opposite. It's you, easier to just not eat. For me. Okay. It's easier yeah, just yeah. to not eat. Yeah. <laughs> it's the gaining weight up to a point. Yeah. Like, yes, I mean, if I wanted to get back to 280, it'd be fucking easy. Yeah. But yeah over yeah. that, you know, there's a point it's where it's, oh, that's fair. That's fair. Where it's hard. Yeah, that is fair. Cause then you're just constantly bloated and full and can't move. Yeah. You know, yeah. So yeah, then yeah. that affects performance and then that fucks with your head and it kind of goes, well, what do you, how do you feel? Like, I think you're leaner now than you have been. Yeah. You look the healthy. same way I felt when I was 260. <laughs> so basically the same. Um, so really not any real difference with that. Have you changed anything with your training? No, <laughs> no. You know, it's, a, I'm, I still train for strength. You know, I can't grab a straight bar. Right. So yeah. it's once, a, once a year, I, I'll pick a lift, like a spider bar squat or some shit like that. Put a number in my head and a weight. Then I have to do that before the end of the year. And it needs to be a stretch goal. So okay. it's kind of like my meat, but I don't have a set date. It's a floating date. Okay. That way I don't get hurt. You yeah, know, the yeah. problem with powerlifting, even Olympic weightlifting and some other things is you have this peak Yeah. and say five weeks out, you start to accumulate damage and you're like, fuck it. You just, you just keep going. You have to keep going. But if I can push that date, yeah. then I can deload that, you know, not occur as much damage. And then instead of October, it's, ah, it's November. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Just push yeah. it that way. Yeah. <clears throat> if I didn't have that each year, I don't know if I'd train at all because that gives me something that has a purpose to train for. Mm-hmm. And for me to do that effectively, you know, and this year it was in December and it, I didn't, I tried to do it early, try to do it before Black Friday because it'd be much easier in my fucking life yeah. to just get that done before everything gets busy. Right, right. And missed it. So then I had to like deload and re peak. So now my peak, instead of being, four weeks was seven okay which lower accessories lower because i pull all that shit out yeah to yeah, be able to peak yeah. that and so after hitting that then you know what was the weight 750 750 has a high fucking box though so <laughs> keep that in mind so <laughs> you know two prosthetics i'm not gonna go fucking super deep but and it, it and that was at 242 where last year it was I wanted to hit 800 because I did that at 300. Okay. You know, so that was the original goal. Then about halfway through the year, I'm like, I need to reassess this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if that's doable, but yeah. somewhere between 750, 770, that's good. And But now coming into the first of the year, because I'm still working on what next year will be, Yeah. my conditioning sucks, right? Because I pulled all that shit out. You right. kind of know how that works. Yeah, yeah. So I have to have that whole first quarter. You know, to, to develop of, that, to develop the conditioning back so I can train the way I want to train. Right. And then it just spools all into that next year, which gives purpose to the conditioning. It gives purpose to the mobility, it gives purpose to all those other things. Right. Because I won't do, I won't be able to be in a position to do what I want to do at the end of the year. Yeah. You take that away. I don't know if I give a fuck about any of the other stuff. I just ride a bike. Yeah. 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 You know, shit yeah. like that. So that play. And so the sneak in the lower weight each year. Is how I've been able to keep the weight down. Would you be motivated? I was looking at the the leg press. I'm like, would you be motivated if you went on and you're like, I, I'm going to do a thousand pounds for 20 reps? Something. Not anymore. When I was training with John, yeah, yeah, but not anymore. Yeah, that's not the same as a heavy single. Yeah, that's fair. For me, there's something about that heavy, especially on a squat. There's it something feels about that good. heavy yeah. single. Yeah, that that will drive me. That other shit was just like the challenge sets and all that stuff. That was just pushing yourself to a point that would be more than what he could do. Yeah, you yeah, know, or yeah, something like that. Yeah, it kind of fed that demon a little bit, but not the same. Right, because that would be something that all I'd have to do is rest the day beforehand. You know, eat a little bit and then you get my it. head right and fucking go. Yeah. Where if it's a single, the shit needs to line up. There, and there's so much more. There's a more, a greater breadth of work. Oh, there's technical work. There's all kinds of shit that yeah. has to play into making that happen. Right. Than just ugh, fucking hitting them on your capsule and just do, you know, right. Go some other fucking place and do what you have to do. Last week we did, I'm, I'm thinking about this now because. <sighs> You, 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 when you mentioned like you hit a, like the first time I benched 500, I remember thinking I was like the, a total animal. And I know that's not a lot in the powerlifting mm-hmm. world, but for me, it was. It's huge. a big fucking bench. Huge. Raw bench is a big bench. 
when so last week I'm comparing this. Last week we did this thing that we're celebrating. Uh, you run a, I ran a mile. I deadlifted 500 pounds. So actually, I deadlifted 500, ran a mile, deadlift 500, and I did it five times. And it's funny you said that because it was fun and it was like, oh, I did that. I ran five miles. I deadlifted 500, but like, it still isn't that that loading one big freaking movement, whether it's a deadlift or a back squat or a snatch or a cleaner mm-hmm. jerk or something like that. And it's like, I think maybe where I'm struggling in my own training then is like, what's the purpose for me? And maybe it's identifying for me, like, is it about possibly making just a YouTube video off of it? Or is it like, I need to have this for my own internal motivation. And I think I almost have to visit this more. Cause now I thought I had in my head where I wanted to go with my fitness and, and your question now is, uh, it's throwing issues into my yeah, head. If I, for myself personally, if I can put something out for the end of the year, yeah. you know, it's far enough out that all these things have to align to happen. That plays in the accountability. If it was just, you know, go from 285 down to 242 and see how shredded I can get. Whatever, fucking 16 weeks and, and that's done. over. Then I fucking put 40 pounds back on because I did that. It's fucking <laughs> done. Whatever. Yeah. You know, it's not, it's not, the, it wasn't the same for me. Right. And, the bodybuilding training really wasn't that appealing either because I always trained for strength or performance or something like that. Right, so right. training for aesthetics, I'm like, what the fuck? In my head is like this. this it's stupid. not the same. Yeah. Like I don't get that's, it. That's, so I guess that would be my question then is like, what do you think it is that, that, that tags somebody early? Cause like, so my first gym away from my dad, outside of training with my dad, the first gym I trained at was a bodybuilding gym. But I think training with my dad so much forced me to think performance-based, not aesthetics. Even when I went and trained at that bodybuilding gym, it was I, I liked the aesthetic appeal, but I wasn't into it. And I don't know what that is that makes it about lifting heavy versus being in weightlifting versus being bodybuilder focused versus sports performance focused. What do you think that is? is that- I don't know. And I've thought about this a lot, right? Because it's, it's kind of how we're brought in. Cause I was brought into all this in a powerlifting club, mm-hmm. you know, so, you know, you're young, you're impressionable. Then you have this social aspect. Like it doesn't matter how fucking big you are. It's what you lift. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah, all yeah. that, yeah. you know, quotes that kind of go around the gym Yeah. where if I was in a gym where it was more like, it doesn't matter what you lift, it's what you look like. Yeah. That would be different. Yeah. So when I trained with John, he had all those stupid isms <laughs> that he would throw out like that. Yeah. And they were completely, I'm like, don't ever say that again. It was like completely like, do you have a pump right now? I'm like, dude, don't ever fucking ask me that again. <laughs> you know, that's, a, that's the stupidest thing that you're going to ask another dude, do you have a pump? Like what the fuck? <laughs> you know, all this stupid shit. And it, every time I would hear it, it's just like, you know, nails down a chalkboard. So I don't know if it's, you know, that social, because of what age you come in and that construct that you come in at, that also plays into if uh, uh, some federations that powerlifters will be in, if they come up through a certain federation, they kind of get ingrained into that. Um, drug-free, not drug-free, they right. kind of get ingrained into that. Um, and there's nothing wrong with all that. You right. know, I kind of right. wish that people would understand that when they're criticizing the others. Yeah, that it's, it's okay. To realize that's how they came in. Yeah. You know, you came in this way, you know, so you're going to go. It's a different door. Exactly. It's a different door. And so. you never saw the other door. Yeah. So you didn't, you didn't go in that way. You don't know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or you're intertwined, I guess, in some gyms to a degree. Don't but you think that way, that as painful as this is, that's almost, I, I, I feel that way with CrossFit. Yeah. Because I, it's painful because I do criticize CrossFit. But it brings in a lot of people. A lot of those impressionable kids come in through CrossFit. Yes. And it's hard to, to it's hard for me to relate to that. that. Well, the, the thing with, with that being as big as it got, a lot of people came into it and they're like, I don't like this shit. And then went into weightlifting. Yeah. Powerlifting. So it did have an influx on all these other areas. True. Because there's people like, I don't want to do this shit. You yeah, know? yeah. So they, yeah kind of come out of that but the ones that stay in it yeah i feel it's the same way same yeah. way it would be with bodybuilding or anything else right right it just it gets a, it, there's a little there's a little hiccup when you're dealing with powerlifting and olympic weightlifting because there's there's an expiration date nobody wants to say it mm-hmm. but there there is you can compete as a master in both for as long as you want but most that come up that go through open you know, through yeah, that, yeah. they're not going to want to compete as a master. No, they're 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 fine. Yeah, they're they're they're, they're good. 
you know because they when they were competing in the open they might have gone to comps and been around people and like ah oh, it's the masters guy over there like that guy's well the hiccup happens when they're done you know they they don't know what to do yeah they don't want to go into bodybuilding yep. they don't want to lift less yeah they don't want to do this so a lot of times they just get fat and drink a lot of beer and don't do anything ever and again. They're, yeah they're totally lost yes 100 percent. i think that's like i think that's an athlete thing that's yeah very consistent amongst athletes in general like i think throwers do that where it's like well i can't throw anymore and i don't want to be the masters guy at, at, at masters meet like at an open meet participating as a master you know you're throwing next to a guy throwing 20 meters and you're some 40 year old throwing 12 13 meters and it's like if you're an open dude when you retire you don't want to be that guy but then you don't know what to do you don't know you don't want to be a coach because you know the sport's misery it's an interesting well in the past there was nobody to look to that went down that route and got into health and fitness and so forth yeah yeah where today there are yeah you know there's yep. people that have gone through done that then they come out and then they find something yeah you know they they keep training you know they find so there's more role models i guess yeah in a weird way because yeah. it's like masters role like longevity role models i suppose longevity role model i don't know what to look That's at them I'm, as. Gonna, I'm gonna take that i'm gonna take yeah. that longevity role model i'm gonna coin myself as a yeah i know no, longevity influencer <laughs> there you go <laughs> that gets into a weird road though <laughs> yeah. and now you get into all that longevity wacko shit yeah and then you get into eventually don't you I, I, <laughs> this might be going down a long road i feel like there's like this longevity you go longevity there's a fine line between longevity and then all of a sudden you're talking about micro dosing mushrooms mm -hmm. and it's like how do we go from i don't know how do we go for how do we get over here that this is like part of this discussion i i always think that that stuff's the longevity is just a weird word to me because what guarantee do you actually have you can do all these things and get fucking have and a heart attack exactly you know so it's like what longevity is there be, right it should be more like quality of life yeah as yeah. soon as you can get it yeah yes you know so it's i don't get like longevity what in 10 years like right. i might be fucking dead then <laughs> yeah you know, i'd like to feel better in three months <laughs> you know so short jeopardy i don't <laughs> i don't know <laughs> what to call that but that's so accurate though <laughs> But that that's where it goes though. Yeah. It goes into this, 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 and then you're fucking waking up at three in the morning taking ice baths <laughs> and have this four hour fucking <laughs> shit to start your day. You have to have a you have to be in a infrared sauna and you have to you have to get sunlight within yes. thirty minutes of the of waking up. Dude, I could take you through that hole. That yeah. hole. It's crazy. And then by the time you actually get to your work, you're stressed the fuck out because you can't do. Because you miss your cold shower. Well, no, you can't do four hours of work in one because you spent the other three hours doing stupid <laughs> shit to get ready <laughs> to be more optimal. Yeah. On yeah. things that still are going to take three hours to get done. It drives me fucking crazy. I was just talking to my wife about this where it's like when the when Wim Hof first came out and it was like breathing and cold exposure, all that stuff. Like there's like one paper that was like, yeah, this is this is good. This is great and i remember thinking like well i mean breathing and being by yourself is probably good it's a good form of like just disconnecting and 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 figuring out what you want in life and it's funny because as the years have gone on from him being out like there's some research now it's like it's not good it's not bad but think about how many hours some people have committed to cold exposure to to cold ba bathing and like dude some people they swear by it whatever but it's like if I was all in on it and I was forcing myself to take cold baths, but I was miserable on a regular basis. And I did that for the last three to five years. I might've lost like four months of my life, just taking cold baths for no reason. Now well, you may not have the business that you have. <laughs> yeah, exactly. of all that, that's where I get into that. And it, it's not new. Cause when you're playing high school football, and you came you know, in after the game. What'd you, you do? You said a cold bath. You yeah. froze your balls off for whatever <laughs> yeah. reason. I don't know. It's just, Dave, go in there. Yeah, like, yeah. Fuck. <laughs> it's just cold. <laughs> for how long? 15 minutes. Yeah. So you can't feel your toes. You go another 10. Yeah. So it's like, this is not new. Yeah, yeah. Like, I was yeah. disliked this a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, right. that's so funny. <laughs> you know, if you live by a lake, you know, the lake's always fucking cold. Okay, fair. Right? So yeah, yeah. Whatever, whatever, you know. Yeah. It's just, it's crazy ass shit that you kind of go through. Um, you had some topics that you sent through the um, 
One was, you want to talk about chains and bands? Yeah, yeah. So I, I had my questions were like, my my experience with using chains would be like, I'll the like literally literally the most experience with chains I've used were be you know doing like a tail extension where you're here on a decline and you're doing like triceps like this pressing and we put chains on it, chains on like a bench like literally only to get a pump as like that that was it I've never used them consistently for blowing up somebody's bench press or something along those lines and I I guess my question was anecdotally I have always sort of felt like chains get you like cock strong like you're really freaking strong you use chains bands make you more explosive or or more dynamic as an athlete and i don't know if that's accurate but it's like if i would try to implement that into like my throwers or a football setting would that be a right assumption or how would you see that being like okay if i were you and you wanted to use it to increase a thrower's back squat or or bench press use chains this way use use uh bands this way well a shitty squat is going to be a shitty squat so putting that out there if if they're i look at any kind of lift or a weak point as physical mental or technical okay right so those i'm before i even would look at anything like that like is there a physical problem here you know is there a mental problem is there a technical problem and with anything you can usually nail it down to one of those three things so assuming those things are all on point so the reason I'm saying this, a lot of people start using chains and bands on their squat, but their squat technique just sucks. Yeah. So then this is not going to make that much difference if they fix the technique compared to that. Now, <clears throat> some of the things with that I see people screw up with all these is if they're, is how they, you can set them up for a multitude of different reasons, but if you're going to use a chains that for accommodating a resistance at the bottom of the list, they should pretty much all come off, mm-hmm. right? Otherwise, you're going to have like three links, deload and reload, which means you have a difference between the bottom and the top of like seven pounds. <laughs> I see this all the time, which is just put more weight on the bar. This is stupid as hell. And now if they, if the weight, if they let the chains just swing, there could be a stability aspect, right? Yeah, yeah. Which is debatable, but I can see a reason for that. Yeah. But where most people screw up with that is the the difference between the bottom and the top is like six pounds. It's stupid. Um, So if it completely unloads and then reloads back up, then you're kind of accommodating that strength curve. If the chains are to be used on a bench or a squat or something like that, and it is coming off completely at the bottom, I wouldn't see any need to change the barbell weight, right? Because they're going to be stronger at the top yeah, yeah. and those lifts. So because the completely deloads, you should be able to accelerate with the same force yeah. as you would normally. And so when people ask about percentages and all that, like whatever, it doesn't really make that much difference if it's coming all off at the bottom. Right. Okay. Bands on the other hand, don't come all off at the bottom. Right. So if it's a bottom or a squat or a bottom of the bench, say it's a bench and it's a mini band, there might still be 40 pounds of tension at the bottom and 80 pounds at the top. In that case, I would take 40 pounds off the bar. Okay. Otherwise, you just increase the, the mean percentage by whatever 40 pounds is. You know, so if it's 200 pounds, you just increase that by 20% at the bottom. So if it's 70%, <laughs> It's, it's, yeah, yeah. it's 90% yeah. now at the bottom and whatever at the top. Right. So those would be mistakes that I see with the bands, some effects that they have that I think are probably more beneficial than the effects that people think they have would be if it's a young athlete and they don't know how to brace or get tight at the beginning of a squat or a bench, and there's a band on there, they're going to almost immediately because you put bands on a bar and you take it out of the bench or you take it out of a squat, you get a rude awakening real quick. Yeah. So what's your natural reaction to that? You're going to tighten up. The other things the bands can do if it's a squat or a bench out of the bottom is if you have a kid that doesn't know how to use compensatory acceleration, they don't know how to apply force. Mm -hmm. A band's going to make them do that because it's, if they try to move it slow out of the bottom of a squat or the bottom of a bench, 
and there's a band on there, they're not going to move it slow coming out of the bottom the second time because that's pulling them down. Yeah, and I'm almost thinking about if you have like a middle school kid or a high school kid, they they quit a little bit earlier. They they don't know. Like you're you're basically saying like they'll learn how to apply force and continuously increase their motor unit recruitment will be better because they're continuously going and they're yes. gonna learn that faster than yes. otherwise. Well, anyway, the, the bigger problem is they may not even be tight enough at the bottom when they start. Yeah. So they bring it down and they get loose. Mm -hmm. And then they try to flex out of there. That's probably not going to happen if there's a band on there. Okay. Okay. Without any weight on the bar. Yeah, just the band. Yeah. So some of the biggest benefits I see out of bands are without even having weight on the bar. From the big, I used to have Gen Pop clients that I'd work with squat with just a very like a micro band. Yeah. Just because as soon as they took the bar out, even if it's a broomstick, they're getting tight. Yeah. If they sit down and they don't stand up with force, they're they're probably not going to come up. You know, so they got to stand up with a little bit more force. Yeah. So it put, chains won't do that, right? Chains don't have that impact because it's not like a rubber band pulling down. Right, right. So now once you get out of that, you know, will bands make you more explosive than chains? I don't know. You know, that gets into like pseudo bro science with that. Right. Um, <clears throat> I would say that I've, I've seen that demonstrated more times than not, but I don't want to say all the time. Okay. You know, with that. And that's just with the main lifts. Now, if you start to get into the Olympic lifts, you're getting out of my domain and I start questioning things like stability, technique, you know, their ability to get under a bar when the bar is moving. So, I mean, there's a lot that goes on with those Olympic lifts yeah, yeah. that are more than just lifting the weight up. There's the athlete going down. Right. And I don't know how that would play into it because now your barbell is going to be in a set plane. Yeah, see, I, I've I've always felt like you shouldn't you shouldn't screw around with the movements with with bands or chains like a, a snatch or a clean or I wouldn't. Yeah, I, I don't. I think it. I think it's reasonable to see potentially if you have like somebody who needs like to blow up their back squat relative to their lifts, maybe to to play with bands and chains as a weightlifter. Mm -hmm. I think that that can be reasonable, but not their actual movements. Now, in a squat, if the band tension becomes great. It can act like a Smith machine in a way. It can act like two other legs. Okay. It will ground you. So you'll see lifters sometimes that would use bands all the time. Then they go to a straight bar and they don't know what the hell they're doing because they're used to having those bands pulling them down, especially if they're using a monolift. Yeah. You know, because once they get set up, they're going to find that path that that just rides straight up and down in. Right, right. So that, that can be a negative if it gets too high in there. Um, so a lot of lifters will pull them out closer they get to a meet, you know, just because of that, so they can feel the weight a little bit better. That makes sense because it's like, yeah, I had never even thought about that. I, I, it's funny too because when if you even have somebody do like a banded good morning, right? Like a just put the band around and they're they could be standing like a, a high school kid. They immediately arch their back, yeah. with the band. And it's like, all right, what if you just put a bar on their back while the band is around their, their neck, you know, obviously the behind them, they're immediately going to have that tension. And that's, that's like one of the fastest ways I think too, to teach a younger kid how to hinge without rounding its back mm -hmm. is, is using that. So that's like, I'm thinking about my own son, my oldest son started, he's, he's lifting now. And it's like, sometimes with that, he does come out and then he'll do like that little shoulder round here and just collapse, like almost just like right here at the bottom. And whereas that band is in there, he, I know he's going to hold that tension. He's going to say tighter. Now yeah. the, the question then is going to become, will that transfer? When the bands are off. When they're off. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's <laughs> physically putting them in and out to be able to see, because for some it might, for others it will not. And it could be that they still are relaxed and they're still in a bad position when they're in the bottom could that be q related too? like when he's when let's you know use an example of the younger kid if if you're giving them the right cues with the bands theoretically when the bands come off if you're still triggering that cue those specific cues might carry over to the bands being removed. should be and it still kind of poses the question of is there something that could be better that would do the same thing right so if it's i call it a soft touch so if 
say they're wearing a hoodie, they only bring the bar down until the bar touches the hoodie, then they come back up. Okay. So they never really release the tension. I think Bill Gillespie used to use um, spaghetti. Okay. He put spaghetti on their All chest, right. and yeah. if they broke the spaghetti, it was not good. Okay. You know, to be able to keep that tension, you know, that may be more effective for that as well. It's, it's, it's what's the deficit, then what are you trying to change? Yeah. And then is this a tool that could do that? I don't think people think this through, you know, as they, they oh, fuck it, throw the bands on. You know, they, right. they don't go through that process. Do you see a specific bar, like 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 a, a specific, let's say, squat bar that responds better to chains versus bands or vice versa, like a safety squat bar or a, another, you know, any other cambered bar, whatever, this bar is better with chains versus with bands? Some of the impacts of the bar, say if it's a safety squat bar, which has a tendency to kind of throw you forward, a band's definitely going to compound that, okay. and which could be good or bad. Like, what's the weakness of the athlete? Are they keeping that position? Mm -hmm. If they're not, maybe that helps keep that position. Bad, if they always break down in that position, and all that's doing is reinforcing that, but that it's not being down. cued yeah. to break it back down. Um, the chains won't really do that, you know, on that bar. Right. Um, usually, if you're dealing with different bars, it's it's the setup that's going to matter. So if it's a, a spider bar or cambered squat bar, it's lower to the ground. You know, so you're going to run into that problem again if they're using chain, how much of it's actually deloading right, right. to the ground because you only have this much range of motion that you're really working All through right. anyhow. Yeah, yeah. So it's, you know, how's that going to work? Right. You know, unless you have 10 chain per side, you know, to kind of make up the that difference. Motion, yeah. Yeah, that you're missing. Then the bands with some movements are just going to have like a chest supported row. Typically, the strength curve on that at the top is never really the best. Right. So a little bit of band on that just to balance that out will make you have to contract harder. So I think that was one thing. Actually, we filmed the YouTube video here before you came out. And I remember Paul Quinn talking about how he felt that accommodating resistance, you know, bands change, whatever, is better in primarily extensor muscles. So like your triceps. Uh, and especially with a pecs, right, in the upper body. But what's interesting is, like, so I actually did an exercise that was I wrapped the bands on one of the seated rows, and I've always felt like, so he would say, he would say or he has said in the past, like, you shouldn't do, like, a banded pull-up because it, it, it doesn't match the strength curve. But then if I would do a row or a pull-up that was banded, I would get, like, and I don't know if it was the bro science of like that, that mind muscle connection or, or if I was just getting more of a pump because of the tension, but I've always felt, even if I'm doing a row with a band, I, I still feel better. So why should I not do that? I yeah. Know. I mean, if, if you feel that connections more and you're contracting harder and you're still getting the full range of motion, right. Cause there's always caveats, right? Right. You can right. put it on there, then not pull all the way through. Yeah. Right. Then so what? You didn't get all the way through. Right. You know, so it's I don't know. It's I think it's more exercise dependent than it's going to be muscle dependent. OK. Because I could I can see where the bottom of a push down, there's really not a whole lot of tension on there. You know, the top of a curl. Right. You know, basically right. gets light through there. Yeah. But you can change angles and right. shit like that. Yeah, I think that's like a, that. That's always been a, a a question that I've I've wondered, like reading his stuff, and I got I was I went to Rhode Island quite a bit, like three times to do certifications when I first got into coaching, and that was one thing I will always remember being like, well, what's like I I don't I don't know. It just it didn't seem like it was accurate, and it's like even if you yeah I don't know. I think it's even when I'm walking around like looking at like a reverse hyper with with bands on like i i would think that would be extraordinarily beneficial but based off of that statement that might not well, be it could be but how's the band gonna pull yeah right because the angle the band's gonna pull isn't really gonna give any tension there at the top because of how it's pulling yeah if you're coming up it's not coming this way it's like in so you might actually even bend your knees slightly more on yeah. the reverse hyper or you'd have to put the band on the reverse hyper and then attach it in front of it so that when it comes up it's yes. more of a download yeah, yeah. okay
the reverse band can give the athletes confidence because they're going to handle more weight. Yeah. And but there's a, there's a limit to where that should be too. So that's something that we've done this year. So um with my prep in the fall with the throwers, we've gone back and forth where I'm having them uh so we set up 8 weeks of the squat cycle to try and push their their 6 rep squat. And every other week we did reverse band high rep at like like 100% of their load basically. And it's like 85% of them all PR, like just blew up with their, with the reverse band. Yeah. See a big part of that could just be psychological. Okay. And that could be, even go back to what you were saying earlier, where it's like a weakness is either physical, mental, or technical. Yeah. And that's where that could fall into place. It, I've even felt like at the top, the physical gains of just being more stable can, can carry over. One question I had was with the reverse band is, uh, you'll see Ryan Krauser, the world record holder in the shot. Well, do he has some videos of him doing like reverse bands, like three weeks out from world championships. And I guess like, is that, is that consistent in the powerlifting world leading into a monster peak? Some will okay. say so they'll put a reverse band on after their top set. Okay. And maybe add 50 pounds more. Okay. You know, that's more common than what people would think. I think that's consistently been my like biggest weakness. And I, and I seeing that with the reverse band set up, I, I felt, I felt like a lot of like, this is something I'm missing. It could be something I, I need to use more. It's easy to test, right? So you put it in and then does it have that correspondence? Does or it not. drive those metrics or not? Yeah. So if it doesn't yeah. and then you don't, right. you know, it's pretty simple. It's it's been interesting because it, the reverse band on their bench was terrible. That's what I didn't understand. Is like we did the exact same layout of the squat to bench, not identical. Certain things were a little different, but like still with the with the insertion of the of the reverse bands every two weeks, and on the bench it did nothing. Like dude, their benches didn't move. I can see that because it's making the bottom easier, okay. and that's usually where they're not going to be as mm -hmm. tight. Mm -hmm. And so now they, it just compounds what they're already bad at. Okay. <laughs> the accommodating resistance part of it is, I think some people overcomplicate this. So if it's on a speed day, you know, or a day that wants to be more dynamic, you know, they every coach has their recommendation on how much band or how much chain or whatever it should be. And with each lift, there's either going to be a way it feels like we talked earlier. There's that pop that you feel that, you know, that that weights in that range that you want yep. gets too heavy. That begins to kind of go away. Yep. Or if the weight's too light and you, it's just too light, you know, you're, if it's a bench, your shoulders are coming off the bench and all that shit. So, I made a video on YouTube, I think last year, where I just put dimes on each side of the bench and just did a set of three going up one dime each time. <laughs> then at a certain point, this feels like what a speed rep should feel like, say 8.8 .8 meters per second. But I hate to put shit out there because you start, you know, people can't measure it. They can't. Yeah, they get yeah, dog made it into right. this, but there's a certain point to where you feel like you can apply the force. The weight's still moving pretty good, and your shoulders aren't coming off the bench, and it's not doing funky shit at the top because you're pushing with everything you have. And then you keep adding a dime per side. There's going to become a point where it's going to get too heavy. You can't do that. Then, it, if you draw a chalk line on where the weight started to feel right, then another one on where it started to feel heavy, right? And it's a dime per side. Then you look at whatever that weight was. And then say it's 55% and then it stops at like 70%. Mm -hmm. There's your three week wave. Okay. And if you use chain, you don't need to change the weight because it comes off at the bottom. Yeah. If you use band, whenever the tension is at the bottom, you take off the bar. It's really simple. That's pretty good. Yeah. That's like very, very simple, especially I feel like that's, 
oh, it's way more simple than, well, so-and-so says I need to use 50% and 25% of band tension. Somebody else says 70% with 15 pound of band tension. Somebody else says 40% with 30 pound of band tension. And then you're playing all these different like, games. First yeah. off, what the fuck does the percent mean? Right. Because where are you taking that from? Right. Your last meet a year ago? Yeah. You know, yeah, where, yeah. where does this even come from? Right. And then it's not regulated during a training phase at all. Right. Or if you feel like shit, yeah. you know, anything yeah, like yeah. that. Yep. So it's not in there. It's not you. So it, to circle back, if you know what it's supposed to look like and what it's supposed to feel like, it's pretty easy to implement. And as a coach, you can see it. I think that's the biggest thing too. That, that, that goes back to what you'd asked about Dr. B. Like, I feel like if you're in a, if you're seeing your throwers in, in this case, benching all the time, it's like, I can tell when it's a speed rep versus it's too light versus like that was slow. Like, yeah. And your first reaction is to yell at them to fucking push harder. Yeah. It's like, Oh, yo, a little bit quicker, yeah. like quicker through the middle. As soon as that, that that's where the line is. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. The other thing you had down there was the gym to social media, but I think we talked about that. Yeah, I think that might have just been like, oh, I don't know. That might have been me talking about. Oh, shit. Yeah, I, I think that might have just been like. Bodybuilding for powerlifting. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Maybe maybe that's a question, too. Like, you're training with John and, and what you would see that as a payoff into, into the realm of, of your actual like powerlifting lifts. I'll circle this back into Olympic weightlifting as well. Okay. Because if if you're using classic periodization, so old flat Kramer linear periodization with a hypertrophy phase, strength, power, peak, <laughs> and then that would kind of fit in there because you have that hypertrophy phase, which is a bodybuilding phase that that's going to then transfer, you know, into that strength. And you'll see the same thing with block training. You know, how long will that motor ability stay before it needs to come back in and kind of cycle through and periodize through. And I would say that's optimal for most people mm -hmm. because they need to put more muscle on. Mm -hmm. And if you're dealing with a lot of classic powerlifting type programs, they might, even Olympic weightlifting when they're younger, they may have a six week hypertrophy block. Like what the fuck? Like how much muscle are you going to put on in six weeks? Mm -hmm. Then they're right into specialization. So you wonder why they never put muscle on. <laughs> right. Yep. So having those bodybuilding blocks where they're going to know damn well that their, their max strength will probably decrease. But once they go to transfer that over a period of time, it should be higher because they have bigger muscle. Mm -hmm. Right. Where this gets convoluted is now you take that same lifter and now they got 15 years experience and they have a decent amount of muscle on their frame. And they now have to take that Olympic lift or that power lift and dial in every single small technical aspect to become better in the timing aspect. That becomes a weird situation to where they may not have enough time over an annual plan to pull away from that because the details that you're trying to fix are so minute that you can't afford to have three months of them not doing anything because when they come back, you got to reteach the basic fundamentals, which they're going to get fast, right? Because they've right. been doing it for 15 years, but you're still looking at a month to be able to get that back, right? And then you're limited on how much you can get into the fine detail stuff where they're breaking down. Yeah. So th this is what happens over the a life of an Olympic weightlifter, maybe even a thrower or a powerlifter, is as they become more and more specialized and higher and higher ranked, the more time needs to be spent on the very minor details associated with their technique that too much of time away from that hurts them in the end. So a younger lifter will look at them and say, well, they never do all this bodybuilding stuff. Like, but they did, uh -huh. you know, so, uh -huh. so that's, that's that fucked up thing where everybody wants to look at what people are currently doing at the top. 
instead of what they did. Yeah. Because what you're trying to address with those top lifters are vastly different than the kid that needs to put 20 more pounds of muscle on. Right. Right. That's so accurate. And it's like even thinking, okay, okay, so this would be my question then. You think that when you're doing, you know, what would be the extent of technical work that you could still do during a, a bodybuilding period? Or could you do enough bodybuilding work during a, a certain period and still do technical work? I guess that's like... Well, you can keep the technical work in and should. You know, if it's a beginner power lifter, I may have them squat just the bar 95 or 135 squat bench and deadlift every training session as part of their warm up. Okay. That's not going to fatigue them, yeah. but it's going to reinforce all those technical, re it's practice. Yeah. Every other sport has practice, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So why wouldn't the lifter have that? You can keep that in, but the technique with that compared to the technique with 80, 90, 95% loads is vastly different. You know, so that's the caveat is yeah. with the more experienced lifters where they really need the work is the technique with the heavier weight, not so much the lighter weight because weight changes things, obviously. Yeah. So th that becomes a whole <laughs> programming structure of how frequently can we put in these heavier loads without running their dick in the dirt. So would you take a guy, let's say a weightlifter and they, they compete you know, they compete and they come off that comp. Would you take that individual then and say like, okay, let's run six weeks or, or let's say they're, they're in train, they're in the competitive realm for five years. Would you have them do like six to eight weeks of, of bodybuilding right after a comp? Or would you do that at another period? Depending on how far out the next comp is. 16 weeks. You would know that better than I, because <clears throat> is that going to take them to, this is what I don't know about weightlifting as opposed to powerlifting. See, powerlifting, they have a bar in their spine mm -hmm. throughout that whole phase, mm -hmm. you know, so that's going to accumulate a lot of damage over a period of time. So by the time the meet's over, they're kind of fucked up. So yeah. it'd probably be good for them to not have a barbell on their hands or on their back if they're more experienced for maybe six to eight weeks. So if I remove that stimulus off their spine and out of their hands, I can let the shoulders rest. I can let the spine rest. But then I can replace that with machine stuff, dumbbell stuff. So I can tell them, you can do anything that you want, but have a bar in your back and a bar in your hands, which there's, there's a lot of options there. There's single leg stuff. So basically, it will, it will bleed into hypertrophy training. With a volume dependent upon what the volume looked like in the five weeks leading up to the meet. So if I look at volume as just total reps and they peaked and they kind of deloaded all their accessory work before the meet, they might only have 250 total reps over a month period of time because they're all heavy, you know, doubles, triples, shit like that. Work reps, so reps over 50%. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Then if I bring them back that week after, and then that first training session has 250 reps, that, that, well, it does a couple of things. They're toast for one thing, but there's a lot of, I call it like a runway. There's a lot of runway there where adaptations can take place if it's just 50 reps, week one, 70 reps. The adaptations are still going to take place without all the trauma and without all the load. Yeah. How much more adaptation are we really going to get? Out of 250 versus 150. Yeah, especially when you got to get back to that 250. Yeah. So in that time that the volume's ramping back to where it needs to be, the weight's being deloaded, which can help that. A lot of that mobility accessory, all that stuff can come in there, the bodybuilding stuff, full range of motion, controlled tempos can all come into there. But what I don't know with the weightlifters is how much accumulated damage are they have? Like after a competition is over, do they feel they got run over by a truck? You know, what's the central nervous system? I don't know that because I don't know the spinal loading isn't really there, but there's still a lot of fucking loading. Yeah, that's interesting because and there still is a quite a bit of squatting, but I think it's like, I think you'll see, it's interesting because I feel like you'll see some weightlifters have to take like, four weeks of like classic bodybuilding like super super simple movements and like they just need time to to get it. especially if you go to world championships or you're going to the olympics you're taking like two months off three months off possibly so i can see that you know a couple of weeks completely off with restoration work and then hypertrophy work for yeah. sure yeah 
and then, but then there's some, and this is where this would go back into that. This is this is a classic example of a type two athlete. Is you'll see some some type two to me a classic sign of a type two individual is somebody who let's say they make a team, they go to worlds, right? They go to worlds and they don't lift well, they don't compete well, but then they go back into the warm up room or they go back into the training hall, and the next day they're hitting a back squat PR, they're hitting like a a, a power snatch PR, and it's like you just competed yesterday. How the fuck are you trash today? How are you still capable? They're pissed off. They're pissed off, mm-hmm. but they they they're pissed off because they know that the person that can't handle the stress of competing on the big stage, and that's like that that type two person. They wanna they wanna get the Instagram video to still show to the world that they are strong. And so that's the weird part is like they somehow still have enough juice left in their nervous system to go back and do that. Do they though? So my question would be, where are they three weeks later? Fair. They they might you know, be so where, Where's that going to tank? Yeah. You know, I mean, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. It's it's kind of like telling a high school kid not to max on the bench press. They're going to go to their go to garage and do it anyhow. You know, so you got to figure <laughs> out how to how to work that in. You know, to be able to accommodate that, and what movements might they be able to do that on, which wouldn't wreak the same damage. It could be a front squat. Yeah. You know, so now the low, well, I don't know if the weightlifters, it could be about the same, but the way of a power lifter, the load is going to be way lighter. Right, right. Yeah. You know, especially as ass to the gas or ass to grass front squat, they're not doing a lot of weight. Yeah, I think, I think one of the things, I mean, that, that, I think that does help quite a bit with the bodybuilding discussion. And I think too, for me, the bodybuilding discussion is something that you had asked me earlier about some alterations in programming as i've aged and some of the big things too are around that of like in-season training for for sports like wrestling or sports like football where it's like it's so easy to maintain strength just by doing like two or three sets mm-hmm. of a movement like go on the bench okay your best let's say you have a kid who's 174 pounder and, and his best bench is 300 pounds go on the bench and do 225 for one set of like just one set of like 10, 12 reps, let's say 10 reps, probably they'll get a big pump out of that. And that's going to hold them over with their strength levels of maintenance, maintaining their strength levels for another two weeks. Oh, plus. sure. And they can bodybuilding work can stay in all the time because you can change how you're doing it. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have to be this, I call it muscle fucking reps. It doesn't have to be, you know, full aggression, full out, you know, 10 reps with max force, you know, you can, you can lower the tempo. You can stop at the bottom, right, right. you know, and try to press without momentum. You know, it's, I call it, you can train a lift for, you can train a movement or you can train a muscle. This is kind of how I break it down in my head. If you're training a muscle, then do you really need to use a shit ton of weight or can you use half the, say it's a dumbbell press. I could have you over there and give you 70 pound dumbbells and tell you, I want you to fail somewhere between seven and 10. Yeah. And you'll find a way to do that. You might hold the stretch for a couple of seconds, right. start with no momentum, flex harder at the top for two. You'll find a way to fail there where most lifters are just going to grab it and they're just going to start just punching out reps yep. where one can accumulate more joint damage and more damage and more recovery demand than the other. But if all you're trying to do is build the muscle, you know, and it's a secondary item of the training that you're doing. Like, you don't want to have to recover from fucking dumbbell presses. No. You know, if you're an athlete yeah. or of a power, the dumbest fucking thing to recover from, right? You just want to stimulate the muscle, yeah. you know, for that hypertrophy. And you can do that in a lot of different ways. You know, most people just default to one way. And now that becomes the problem because of that. Just how the movement's done. They'll, they'll, they'll shit on the range of motion. So they use three quarter range of motion, to keep muscle tension on or whatever the fuck they're doing. And, um, and that has its place in time. I'm not saying it doesn't, <laughs> but when it's a supplementary aspect of a program, it doesn't make sense to me. When you mentioned there with the, the muscle fucking, <laughs> how many sessions, like when you were, let's say you're in a deep prep, like with John, how many, how many sets how many sets a, a session would you just go all in on that? Where it's like, all right, yeah, we're doing, I don't know, let's say we've got two. And, and how many, and would you do that on like 
let's i don't know how the, he would set it up but let's say he did a leg press and then a walking lunge or something i don't i don't know like how many exercises and how many sets in a day would you do it well that scaled up over a period of two years right so it started four exercises for whatever sets and and then that scaled up to a ridiculous amount of time because he wanted to get to a point where if anybody came out to train they wouldn't be able to do it um so i don't know how much of that was really necessary but when that was at its its peak one of the movements would be insane you know just range motion doesn't matter just fucking just do it just fucking kill it for whatever it was going to be and then everything else was more controlled as far as how the reps were done but the sets were they they would ramp up high six work sets that was the only and they thing. would all be trashing it mm -hmm. holy and it, it might have started at four and then the next week five then the next week six and then it would kind of cycle back down or the movement would change then we kind of cycle back through so it was all physically kind of put in there with with that in mind to kind of build that work capacity up over a period of time some things just didn't feel right you know so then it would cycle out something else would come in there but with the he did more work sets than anybody I've ever worked with. Because I've come from the background and you work up, you do one hard work set. Yeah, and you're good. You're fucking done. Yeah. But this was like you work up and there's six work sets. You know, I'm bored out of my mind. <laughs> <laughs> so would he do, like, let's use a leg press or, you know, a bench or something, like something along those lines. Let's say you do those six sets and then with the remaining exercises in the in the day, they would just be nice, controlled, like very... Yeah, but still all taken to failure. Okay. Damn, all of those. So you could do like another three to four sets on five exercises and they would all go to failure. Mm -hmm. The lat work for a certain period of time was over 30 sets. <laughs> work sets. In one day. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you're saying physically built up. Mm-hmm. Now, I, it bored the shit out of me, but it, the way I kind of looked at it is the longer those sessions went and the higher the work capacity was and the higher calories burned, I didn't have to do cardio. Yeah. yeah so I'd yeah. rather do that than have to do cardio because the calories burned were far exceeding right. what I'm going to do pedaling for 45 minutes. Yeah, unga ungodly high. Yeah, so the volume was definitely high, but there were also other phases and other programs to where the volume was very low. It didn't follow more like a high-intensity model with more frequency yeah. than some of the other ones. What would be the goals in a higher intensity? Just change. Yeah. How would John figure in with, with like conditioning? How would like cardio work? Like how would he factor that in? That would come in if it was a high intensity. Okay. You know, so if the training is going to be 30 minutes or 40 minutes, you know, then cardio would be in there. I know that the train is longer. Um, didn't really matter. Yeah. It wasn't very often. I've often said I feel like that a lot of the lack of, of bodybuilding and sports performance is that people have this this mindset of like they'll see like uh you know you see ronnie coleman pictures they're like well he can he can't move or whatever so it's not going to transfer over and it's like well the, it doesn't mean we have to do six sets on a big huge lift to trash a muscle like a, a younger kid or even any you know you can get away with still bodybuilding and doing three sets of 20 or something as long as you're getting at least i think at least one of those sets to failure and you're learning how to feel that that tension most people are not going to get that big yeah. right so there's going right. to be an oxygen demand as well yeah when I mean, you take lift bodybuilders that are that big you know obviously the fatigue that they're going to accumulate because of that muscle mass doing the work is yeah. requiring a lot more oxygen than somebody that's got 50 pounds less weight, weight. yeah 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 same thing you'll see when you're dealing with super heavyweight weightlifters or powerlifters, there's only so much energy they're going to be able to exert because they're moving so much mass. Right, already. Most athletes will never have to worry about it. You know, right, it's, right. It's kind of like this 
false nomer that makes no sense. Would you guys, when you were doing those 30 lat sets, was it all just, was it all back work in one day? Would you do any pressing at all? Mm -mm. All back and all back. Would you do like any tries or buys with that or just no. all back? It was a bro split. You know, so during the week, there'd be like an arm day, which took me like 20 minutes. <laughs> then another day was a shoulder day, which I could probably get done in 10. <laughs> you know, the back day was big. The leg day was big. Chest was semi, semi big. But it, again, it was all, I think where a lot of bodybuilders will screw up is this was all physically designed too. You know, so it would ramp up, then it would come down. It would ramp up, it'd come down. Now, each time it ramped up, it may ramp up to a higher level than what the last ramp was. But there's, there are most that are just going in and training, they, their programs lack any phasic structure whatsoever. Yeah. You know, so yours is, you know, high volume, you know, high intent, high volume, low volume, high volume, high. There's, there's a phasic structure there. Right, right. You know, and... An undulating structure is basically yeah. what you have in there. I don't think most people think about this shit. Yeah. They just go in and do what they want to do and then stack that on the next and the next and the next. And they wonder why What's going on? a year later, they're not going anywhere. Right. Like, well, what the fuck are you even doing? Right. You know, what is the underlying structure here and what's it leading towards? And in bodybuilding, it's a little bit different because in, with your athletes, you have these metrics that you're working towards. You know, in powerlifting, there's metrics. If it, you know, Westside, we had metrics of max effort exercises and the main movement. So there's always these metrics you're using to gauge, mm -hmm. you know, where you're at. What, body bunny, it's what, tape measure, body fat, mirror. You know, there, there are metrics there, but most aren't it's even using any metric to be able to really know. Right. It's more, it's more, I guess, abstract. It's way abstract and it's difficult. I'm not saying it's not difficult. It's definitely yeah. difficult because yeah. you got to be able to manage that. You know, and coaches help with that because they can see, you know, kind of what's going on with that. But body fat changes the way somebody look changes too. Can I, I want to ask a question. Um, when you worked, when you, this is like switching off of bodybuilding, but it made me think about this because I've had this, I had a conversation last year with one of the power five strength coaches that I'm close with. And he's like, He's trying to figure out, okay, if I bring in a mobility guy and I have, he's the head guy and I can bring in a weightlifting guy and I can bring in a powerlifting guy and a functional guy, that's how I can sort of develop my system with all those little attributes, which I think might be a little bit of overkill, but they have so much money. Some of those programs do. One thing I would, when you brought this up, when you would consult with some of these programs, what would you see as their biggest weakness that you thought like, why aren't you doing this? Like, they haven't defined their metrics that they're going to use that are going to have that correspondence. Okay, yeah, so. And a younger coach won't know that, right? They, they won't, but other coaches can at least give them some kind of clue as to what it's going to be. I mean, universally, most strength coaches are going to tell you things like a clean, an overhead press, yeah. a squat. Right. You know, they're going to, uh, 10 yards, you know, they're going to throw some things out universally. That, that's a good starting point. Yep to kind of gauge from but then they need to pay attention like what got better in this athlete than they did get better on the field you know high school kids sometimes what you do doesn't fucking matter what you need to be doing is you know running their plays by them yeah in between every set because they don't know what to do when they're so on they know the field. their assignments yeah, yeah they don't know yeah. what to do they yeah. can be the best conditioned athlete but if they're going the wrong way it doesn't matter it doesn't matter yeah. you know so now you suck as a coach yeah because they're not getting better. I think it's funny you said it. Like, <laughs> I, I remember being like a junior in high school and being like, okay, it's third and 13. They're probably going to throw the ball. And I remember thinking like, oh, so there's situations in the sport of football that I need to be aware of. And that's literally the case. Oh, yeah. Which is also why the metrics would change from high school to collegiate to. Oh, it changes vast, vastly, and it changes based upon position as well. I mean, a quarterback or a linebacker has to have visual acuity. They need mm -hmm. to be able to see everything. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, is that being trained? Is that part of the program? Because if, if that's the position they're in, but they can't see the field, then they suck. Mm -hmm. and they need to gain a ton of weight and be a D lineman. Yeah, you yeah, yeah. So yeah exactly. <laughs> but even there, they got to go on field. So yeah. essentially, essentially, you're saying those defined metrics are going to be the big thing any collegiate strength coach. Sure. Has. Yeah. I mean, if it's a Olympic weightlifting, your goal is to make those two 
lifts stronger. Yep. Powerlifting is increased squat bench and deadlift. Well, you can just do those things and to a point that will work, but at some point you got to find the things that make those things better. Right. Right. And then under, so it's a, it's a layers. So here's what you want better. Then what are the things that make it better? Yep. You know, so West side. So you got the bench here. Then we know that the floor press and a one board press mm -hmm. and a close grip incline made my bench better. So that's the second layer. I need to make those better. So then the third layer is what do I need to do to make those better? Yeah. 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 Because what's holding those that. back? Then that feeds down into what the supplemental exercises are going to be. And then what's the technique? It's a, to me, it's the same thing with you no, know, regardless of what the sport is. If you have the right main indicators as drivers, but you don't have 20 of them. Yeah. I think coaches get lost then in you get, that. Then, you, then you're analyzing everything and you're just like, well, what the fuck is it? Yeah. And there, I mean, if it is a football player, there can be 20 of them, but their position coach is taking care of 10 of them. Yeah. That's his job. Yeah. And then what are the ones that peel back to mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. you do? Right. Then how do you measure it? Because it may not be the right metric. Yeah, and 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 are the measurements even of a tool that you're using consistent to like? I mean, that matters to a point. But sometimes things are closely related that you'll know. Yeah. Right. So yeah. if it's your downset of the bench press, there's probably going to be some correspondence to that to a push up to failure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, so yeah. you don't always have to test that. You can kind of test yeah. it by just watching something else. The problem comes when they just start throwing all random shit in. I think that was my concern when I heard, like, okay, we're going to hire a functional guru versus a you know a guy that trains barefoot versus a power lifter versus a weightlifter versus a bodybuilder and they're going to be part of our strength system and it's like well then how many it's like you got too many cooks in the kitchen i guess then well like, see my question would be what, what yeah what are your main indicators yeah and how does this person help to to, to fuel address that. one of those yeah because if it's not addressing any of those then you don't need that person in there right because the last thing you need is another nev another indicator and where is it on the layer? Yes. It's like, all right, if that's a third layer, they better be making a tenth of what everybody else is Sure. Making, yeah. And a good coach is going to figure out where their deficits are in that hierarchy. Right. And then bring people in to fill those. Right. To be able to, because ultimately every coach and every lifter at a higher level is, is in the process of developing their own philosophy. Yeah. Right. And then once that's developed, the last thing you want to do is to have somebody come in and say, that's all wrong. Right. And right. then you change everything. Yes. That's fucking yeah. stupid. Yeah. Because even if it's 60% wrong, you don't want to change the 40% no. that you already have established because it took five years to learn that. And that happens a lot. I think when, when I was doing that, I think that was probably the most refreshing thing was I wasn't going in there saying, okay, everything you're doing is fucking stupid. Right. Do this, you know, because then you're just implanting something over there, which for most of the people, if I did that, they wouldn't have done it anyhow. Right, right. Where it's, it's let's figure out what you are tracking. Is it actually having correspondence? Do you know it is? Right. Right. You can't just assume, do you know it is? And then where's where's the hole? Where's one one little gap, like one slight gap off of that? If yeah. if everything that you're tracking is effective, yes. And I may not be able to fill that gap. Right, right. You know, but they need to at least know what the fuck that gap is before they start calling other people in. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, think you can call everybody. You a recovery guy, a you know, speed guy, flexibility, mobility, strength, Olympic weightlifting, powerlifting. Doesn't matter. You bring in 50 fucking coaches yeah and not one of those coaches probably know how to even coach the collegiate football player mm -hmm. none of them yeah right so there's that dynamic too that now you have to take that and you have to apply it to a weight room full of 100 kids that are 18 to 24 <laughs> yes. and you're 45 years old how are you relating to them yes and may, you... maybe it's being distilled through an assistant yeah how are you getting them to do the work that you deem necessary yes yep yeah that's another challenge
any other topics that you had that you wanted to cover? No, I think that I think that that was it. That's like exactly what I wanted. I think like from from discussing this stuff with you, I think it's one awesome to to be here and talk to you about it. But just just get that that stuff. Things that I feel like are are missing in my training system that I think I could add in, and that you know, ideally, I I think the band stuff for me with the squats was huge, and, and I think that that. It was huge, and then at the same time, I'm going, why the fuck didn't the bench work? And now it's like, okay, now I, I know where I can go with that. And maybe it is even, you know, we do a quite quite a lot, a lot of, of pad bench. Uh, we don't use a board, but like now I'm like, well, maybe we should use a board, or maybe we'll do pad bench, um, and we'll see a huge increase in their bench when we're doing pad benches because they're holding more tension, and they're, they're usually moving it faster. And I hadn't thought about that with the reverse with the reverse bands on the bench. Well, the other thing with kids with boards, right, is some will do a soft touch, some will do a hard touch, some will touch and let it sink. Yep. Right now, over that same period of time, they may do a soft touch the first time, and then and, it's like yeah, then through. yeah, they learn how to let it sink, and now they think they broke a PR. Yep. But they just learned how to muscle fuck it up better. Yeah. <laughs> right. So it, there needs to be consistent. Not that any of those are wrong. Like they could all be implemented at different times, but sometimes with kids, they need more instruction yeah. than just the board press. Yeah. Yep. You know, cause they'll, they'll find very unique ways to do that. But I've seen people go from like a soft touch to a sink heave. Yeah. I broke a 50 pound PR. I'm like, actually you didn't. You didn't do it. You did. It was a different you know. lift. Yeah. It yeah. was a different lift. So what's it like, um, growing all your own food? <laughs> I think growing all the, all of my own food. I think the big thing is like, how many chickens do you have, dude? At my peak, we've had we've had over 180 chickens. As of this moment, we don't have any. Okay, um, mainly because it's just winter time. It's like once we've cycled through layers, or if we're raising broilers, they're called for meat. It's like, all right, we don't you know we don't need them right now. Um, I think it's it's funny. It's the worst feeling of raising your own food is coming out and being like, "Why is there thirty dead chickens out here?" And they're just torn to shreds, like a raccoon got yeah. in or a fox. And it's like you spend all this time and money, and where I, I it feels exactly like the business. Where you're like, <laughs> "What is the business? <laughs> yeah, why isn't this working? What what is going on?" And like. The funny thing is, is like the chickens are idiots, you know, or if you're raising turkeys, they're like destined to die. It's like they have a death wish from day one and you've got to keep them alive. And it's like, it's just the same concept of like, well, we got to feed them right now. The first thing I got to do is feed them, water them, make sure that the the shelter that they're in is protected and then move on because there's, you just got to keep, mm -hmm. keep rolling. And I think that that's like the big lesson with poultry and, and all I've ever had was poultry and, and like right now we we still have geese right now which are they just terrorize my kids <laughs> especially like my younger kids they'll like rip their hands but the pigs are the one that have been like the easiest that like by far and away the easiest to raise um our chickens and stuff we we move through the grass so i think they, we would move them on a day-to-day -day basis and one of the unique parts about that is like you can see where where they are and where how they decimate the the soil and stuff and then like two weeks later they're the soil is super green there I, I think that that's like the cool part and i think too just with kids it's it's the the discipline of like having to go feed and do something on a daily basis and take care of something that's not you i think that that's important that's like a i think you can teach that a little bit with having a pet too but i think there's something with something you're not connected to really emotionally I think it, it is valuable. And then when you're actually eating it, it's like, well, it's, I don't know. It just feels sort of cool. But I, we also do have quite, uh, probably like a half acre garden with like sweet potatoes, tomatoes, onions, um, garlic, and things along, um, along that, those lines. And I think that that's also just a consistent, valuable thing for, I think, health, but also probably most importantly with your family, I think, really. How so? Just because of the time that you spend planning on a year seeing okay well right now in the winter time there's not much going on but in in the spring there's going to be some type of preparation there's going to be some way that we have to figure out how are we laying out the the 
let's say use the vegetables as an example, where are we going to be planting sweet potatoes versus where were the sweet potatoes last year? Where are we putting the onions versus, you know, where were they last year? Um, and, and prepping that, then laying everything out and then actually going through planting it and then taking care of it, making sure like, you know, there's not a ton of weeds or they don't have a fungus or anything along those, those lines. I think that that's, that can be a, a really effective way to help raising and, and helping a kid be aware of where they're the efforts that go into having food and, and, and anything that you're eating, like there is energy and time that goes into that stuff. And I think that that can then correlate to other habits and to other traits that you would want, you know, to instill in your kid, but it's also the time that you spend with them too, then too. Well, they'll, they'll learn that it just doesn't, up pop here. up in the grocery store by accident and they learn the life cycle with with like with the pigs it's like that's clearly the animal that's here right now and then in six weeks that's also the pork chop that i'm eating and i think when you can when you can think through that lens then you might have more respect for eating the banana in the in the rest or in the grocery store i think it's i think that's stuff that i i do value and like for us we we heat our house with a wood stove so it's also like, we've got a plan. How many cords of wood do we have? Who's cutting it? Who's splitting it? When is the whole family getting together to do this? And we've got to do this on at least two weekends out of the year where we're going like three to four days of lining everything up, getting the trees out of the woods that we have and, and making sure the shit gets done. And it's like, we put in a, we put in a mini split at my house. And it made me feel like I was cheating to a point. I was, I felt guilty, but it, what ended up happening was like, we still aren't even really using the mini split yet. Now we use it for, for air conditioning, which we didn't have before. This was three years ago. But now that, now that we can pay our bills, it's like, all right, we have that there, but we still, I still think something like firewood and, and prepping for your food. And then, you know, another thing, we have an entire fruit orchard of pears persimmons pawpaws um apricots stuff like that or, or nectarines laying that out and we have like a fruit tree set up and i've tell i'm telling the kids eventually in in three to five years i want to have the orchard big enough so that we can move the pigs over to where the trees are and then the pigs can eat whatever's dropped from the trees that we don't pick and I don't know if that's going to happen. I don't know if that's going to go the way I want it to go. But the fact that they're thinking about it, I think, is is good because I don't want them to have the same short-sighted errors that I've had in in business. And I know that it's a weird connection, but I think if they're aware of long-term thought process, I think that that's important. No, I think that's important for is for, for coaching, anybody. training, for anything. Yeah, yeah. Because we we're all attracted to the short term. Yeah. But the longer term is kind of fuzzier. Yep. Like I used to ask people when I was mentoring them to build a like a four-year business objective and that's impossible to do with most people like they can give you two years but yep. four years becomes a little bit too far even with the lifters if i'm working with them and say they have the this overreaching objective i want to squat x well, like how many meats do you think that's going to take yeah yeah right the first assumption is they think all meats are going to go well <laughs> right which isn't true. Yep. Like, okay, so you think it's going to be three. It's really seven. Yeah, yeah, So yeah. now we're at three years. Yep. Like, oh, fuck, three yeah. years. And then you can peel that back, though, and say, well, if this is really what you want, and this realistically can happen in three years, then if we spend the next three months just working on your technique yep. and nothing else, so you don't have to lift maximal weights or anything, yeah. but just focus on that. That's really a small period of time. In the scheme of in the, whole, the whole scheme. Yes. But when they're looking short sighted, they can't wrap their head around taking three months right. to fix, you know, technical issues that are bad. They can't. They have to lift heavy. Yeah, they yeah. can't. They'll get weak. Yeah. But it's 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 three later years on. away. Yeah. It you doesn't know? matter right now. Oh, it's shocking how many people can't project out. I had a conversation, this is about four weeks ago, with a weightlifter. And I'm like, dude. You can't just give me three more months of this. Three more months. She's like, I can't do it. I have to stop. I need a break. I need a break. And dude, world class, the best weightlifter I've ever coached. And I was like, you got three more months to compete. This is this is less. It was less than two percent of her career up to this point. 
but it's the immediate case. And even when you pitch it that way to a lot of athletes of like, it's only like that three month time frame. It's only 2% of your whole career when mm -hmm. you're projecting. Just commit to that now because on the back end, it's going to be so much better dealing with that. But I, I don't know. I think there might be some internal, I, there, there's probably some short-sighted thing in our body that that is genetically like, it's better to be, to, for survival to be short-sighted because you, the immediate, yeah. uh, you know, the, to get some food or whatever bullshit it is. Andrew Huberman probably has a podcast on it, but it's like, <laughs> but I think like there, there is, it's, that's also what makes it that much more challenging, but also rewarding to play the long game. And I think, you know, going back to it, like the, the food and the, the, the daily responsibility of getting of consistently, I love this, not to get too far off of this is like the firewood part is every day my kids have to go outside and they've got to bring firewood in and every day they've got to get uncomfortable to then get comfortable. And it's like, that's one of their, you know, we've got twins that are five. It's like, Yo, Seneca and Keenan, you guys got to go out and you got to get five pieces each and you got to go outside and then bring it in. And it's like, who else is going to get that firewood? And I think that that's like a, maybe one of those, those teaching lessons that I then try to also instill in, if we take care of, you know, what you're talking about, if I can teach a football player for five months, how to have good clean technique. Then I know when he's a senior in high school and he's cleaning shit loads of weight, like it doesn't matter. He can go to college and he's going to be on it because his technique yeah. that he spent in seventh grade paid off when he's 19, 20 years old. But it's so hard to think that way. Yeah. With, with that in mind, any final thoughts that you have? No, I, I, I don't have, I mean, I, I, I have a lot of thoughts, but I think, <laughs> I, I think for me, it's just, I, I appreciate you having me on the podcast, dude. I think it's like, this is such a, a great experience, ex experience for me. And, and I want to thank you for having me. Uh, I think it's great too what you've done for the the strength world, and I think even just these conversations, it's good for being open for everybody to recognize, like openly sharing your information. One can help you have a business, but two, it's going to help impact a, a very very large breadth of people. And I I just want to thank you for that. Well, thank you for coming out. Yeah. With that, uh, how do people find you? So if you guys head to uh, garagestrength.com or you can go on YouTube and just type in Garage Strength. We also have another channel called Peak Strength. Uh, our app is Peak Strength. You can go to peakstrength.app, uh, the Google Play Store, the Apple iOS Store. You can download Peak Strength. We're also on Instagram uh, at Garage Strength. And then my personal Instagram is Ghostface D Miller. Um, so you can find me on all of those different channels. And I also have a whole side project related to throwing, which is Throws University. And we do have a Throws specific youtube channel if you want to check out any of those videos as well i think you've said that before you did that really well <laughs> i was about yeah. to do the uh, i was gonna do like my like whole point closer. yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> point to the videos <laughs> we'll have a link in the description guys we're done yeah peace <laughs> all right guys we've got a new limited edition drop the original mountain dog tea that john meadows had us design from the very beginning so it's the first tea that he had made once again, this is a limited edition item. So when they're gone, they're gone. While I have your attention, you've seen me wear this one in a few podcasts to date. We've been holding back on it. This here, the four star T, I think that's what we call it. It's on the website, new items, also under limited edition. Check out our shoulder saver pads. It's an easy way to do limited restricted range of motion exercises like board press that basically you just pop the pad on the bar, reduces the range of motion, pop it back off when you're done. Thank you guys for the support. Head over to EliteFTS.com. All right, guys, if you like the Table Talk podcast, then you're going to love the crew. If you're struggling with trying to get through a sticking point, you're trying to figure some specific aspect of your training out that you just can't dial in, you're dealing with injuries, you're trying to figure out how to better optimize your training, all the stuff you're seeing on social media is confusing and all you need is a little guidance and support or just somebody to look at your lifts to make sure that they're either heading in the right, right direction or if there's a weak point in the lift, they can point out what that weak point is. Well, that's what we have the crew for. So when you join the crew, you get an extra Table Talk podcast each month called The Crew Cast. You also get access to our Discord community, which has a training Q&A, form checks with top coaches, mindset section, nutrition, training logs, programs, over 30 ebooks, plus exclusive ebooks just for the crew, webinars, lectures, 
seminars, giveaways from ranging from full strength equipment. We've given away many yoke bars this year. We've given away actually pieces of strength equipment as well as accessory items and you get exclusive crew discounts. So go to the link in the description that says join the crew, click it, join now and start getting stronger today. Elite FTS was founded in 1998 with the aim to live, learn and pass on. We've done this through training related content that allows you to become the strongest athlete and coach that you can. Over the past two decades, actually two and a half decades, we've published more complimentary training media than anybody else in the industry. When you look at the number of articles, the Q and A's, the blogs, the videos, the podcasts, there's over a million pages of content that we've put out there. We've been able to do this through your support of Elite FTS. So when you purchase Elite FTS strength equipment, bands, accessories, gear, apparel, or anything through the site, you directly help support the content that we put out, which in turn helps support other people on their journey of becoming stronger and better coaches. So stronger athletes and better coaches, which encompasses the aim and the vision to live, learn, and pass on. So I thank you for the support that you've been giving for the past 25 years and encourage you to keep supporting Elite FTS into the future so we can all help more people become better and stronger. Discount code TABLETALK for 10% off your first order.